I think that's the gentleman there. I think so. No, no, no that's right. Ready? I don't know. I, what an idea for now? We don't know? Outside of it. Okay, well, should I start? Yes, please do. Okay. Good afternoon. We're going to get started with our keynote address. If I could get everybody's attention, please. The sound system is. Working. Hello. Can I get everybody's attention to start the keynote? We're going to start. We're going to start. Now. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Please take Great. your seats. <clears throat> I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Bruce Rydell. Bruce brings decades of high-level international foreign policy experience to his role as senior fellow and director of the Brookings Intelligence Project. He also serves as a senior fellow in the Saban Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institution and has been a senior advisor on South Asia and the Middle East to the last four presidents of the United States. In addition, Bruce is a prolific writer and has written several books on South Asia, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Bruce, we had five interesting presentations this morning, really getting into the issue of education reform in Pakistan and who the key players are. And so now we're going to turn to you to kind of give us a, a, a global perspective of what's going on in the world, and then maybe we can focus in on Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha, for that very kind introduction. Thank you for inviting me here today, and thank all of you for the work you're doing on what I think is one of the most important issues that I can think of today, which is trying to reform and improve education in Pakistan. I'm not going to talk very much about education. Um, I'm a grad school dropout, so I don't really know much about how education systems work. Um, what I want to talk about, and what I was asked to talk about, is the problem of radical Islam and extremism. We are now uh, 16 years after Al-Qaeda declared war on the United States of America. Now, most people have forgotten, but in 1998, Osama bin Laden, Ayman Zawahiri, a Pakistani and a Bangladeshi and another Egyptian issued a statement saying, we are at war with America, and every single American, man, woman, and child, is a legitimate target for this war. What is remarkable, 16 years after it's begun, is the resiliency of our enemy. It's not a very pretty picture, and I apologize, you've all just eaten to talk about terrorism right after a meal, or in some cases still in it is not the most pleasant thing to do. But if we look across the Islamic world today, Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaedism, and the idea is actually more important than the organization. The narrative, the ideology is more important than the organization. Al-Qaedism is probably stronger, more diffuse, and more widespread than it was 16 years ago. 16 years ago, we were largely looking at a problem we thought was confined to Afghanistan and Pakistan. That problem hasn't gone away, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But now the problem goes all the way from Mali to Indonesia. And it has become a more violent, a more extreme, a more brutal organization than it has ever before. Fortunately, for the first 15 years of this war, we didn't see hostages being executed, at least not American hostages being executed. We've now passed a new and very dangerous momentum 
in doing that. I think we all know, I think all of you in this room in particular know, that this is not an Islamic movement. What Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaedaism speak about is not Islam. This is a tiny minority of Muslims who want to hijack a great religion and a great civilization for their own political purposes. Their survival, their resiliency is remarkable though. Look at Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and Pakistan, the so-called Al-Qaeda core as it's described in the US government. We have inflicted more blows on that organization than any other part of the Al-Qaeda mechanism. And yet, it's still alive, it's still functioning. It just attempted to carry out one of the most audacious terrorist plots since September 11th. For those of you not familiar with it, at the beginning of last month, Al-Qaeda tried to hijack, literally, a Pakistani naval frigate uh, named the Zulfiqar. It had insider support within the Pakistani Navy, and the intention was to hijack this frigate and then use it to an attack an American aircraft carrier. Now, it's an audacious plot. It may have been a fantasy. The possibility that they could have pulled it off may have been zero, but it demonstrates they are not defeated, they have not given up, and they remain a serious threat today. So I ask myself, why? Why, after 16 years, are we not doing better? And I think the fundamental answer is a simple one. It's a neglect of the political side of the counterterrorism struggle. We are very good at the military side. We're experts at it. We have the finest special forces in the world. We have a fantastic air force. We can build the most sophisticated drones and drone technology. We can intercept phone calls, emails, you name it, around the world. We're not so good at the political side. And on the political side is where we see, the, I think, the big deficiency today. And I just want to highlight three areas of it. First, it's the policies of the United States. They don't hate us because of what we are. That's hogwash. I know you hear that from people all the time. But as Osama bin Laden, I think, quite rightly put it at one point, he said, if this was about who you are and how you dress, we would have attacked Sweden not the United States of America. It's not about who we are. It's not about democracy. It's not about our way of life. It's about the policies that we pursue. And several of those policies we know need fixing, and we don't do anything about it. And of course, the highest level on that priority is our policy towards the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. This president has wisely and frequently mentioned the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the heart of the cancer that produces so many extremists. And he has tried to address it with policy actions in each of his times in office, and he's given up. He's given up both times. I know it's a hard thing to address, but as long as it goes on, we will continue to see thousands of new converts to violent extremism. The Gaza war this summer was a heavenly gift to Al-Qaeda, which it has mobilized effectively. There are other such conflicts, frozen conflicts that we spend far too little time thinking about. One in the South Asia is, of course, the Kashmir conflict. No president since John F. Kennedy has seriously tried to address the Kashmir conflict. And yet we know that it breeds violent extremism. We know that it is a rallying cry for groups like lashkar e taiba We know that it's a rallying cry for attacks on America. These things are not easy to fix, but neglecting them is no solution whatsoever. Second is the problem of governance. The Islamic world, for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part, has been so poorly governed for the last half century it has reached the bottom of the UN's list of countries and places with poor governance. The entire Arab world, for example, from Morocco to Oman, has been ruled by police states for the last half a century. And we have been a big part of endorsing the survival of those police states. We've occasionally had second thoughts about it. Said, well, maybe this isn't a good idea. But when push comes to shove, 
We have supported the Mukhabarat police state system across the Arab world. And when a military coup a year ago overthrew a democratically elected government, which albeit was not doing a particularly good job of governing, what did we do? Nothing. We stood back. We reinforced the narrative, the ideology of al-Qaeda, that only jihad is the solution, that democracy, political reform, Twitter, Facebook, all that stuff is fine. But as al-Qaeda said on, on the 11th of September this year, only iron fixes iron, meaning only jihad works. Now, that's not the right answer, but we have helped to reinforce it. And fourth, of course, the standard of living. The United States and the rest of the Western world have been a part of the political system which seeks to extract from the Muslim world mostly oil and natural gas. It puts very little effort into building infrastructure, building educational systems. We're very good at assisting the Gulf sheikhs in building hotels. We don't put any real effort into encouraging them to do something like building schools building the infrastructure, finding jobs for people. Now, all of the things that I'm talking about are very, very hard to do, and I'd be the first to admit it. I think when President Obama came into office, he recognized all of these things. And if you think back to 2009, he spoke about all of them, about a new American outreach to the Islamic world, about dealing with the problem of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and ending settlements. He talked about good governance. He talked about change and reform. But six years later, all of those efforts have atrophied. And we have a tremendous imbalance in our approach today. The military counterterrorism part of the strategy is on steroids. The political part of the strategy has atrophied and died away. Is there a simple solution in sight? I doubt it. I don't think that we're going to turn this around anytime soon, but now that we are engaged in six open-ended military conflicts in the Islamic world with no political end state yet defined for even one of them, we are going to need to reevaluate our strategy, go back to basics, and think about how we're going to combat Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaedaism more successfully in the decade ahead than in the last 16 years. I hope I've not been too depressing. I know you all just ate. I wish I could have given you a more uplifting comment, but that's where I think we are today. And I look forward to your questions, particularly easy ones. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Now we can see why you've been briefing the last four U.S. presidents. You're such a great uh, briefer on, on very complicated topics. Um, I'm going to open it up to Q&A. Let's keep the questions short to about a minute. Um, Madam, do you want to go first? Uh, thank you, Sir. My name is Luciana Rodriguez Sancho, Argentina, and the U.S. Foreign Service. National Defense Force. Uh, my question is, you said, or maybe I misunderstood, that maybe that although the United States has high technology and the Um, there's an awful lot of blame here, and it can be spread around in a lot of places. Uh, you are absolutely right to take us back uh, 10 years ago uh, to 2003, 2004. The decision to go into Iraq will be remembered as the biggest foreign policy failure in the history of the United States, in my judgment not only because it engaged us in a war we didn't need to engage in and created an al-Qaeda franchise in Iraq that didn't exist before we started, but because it also meant we stole resources and priorities from the conflict we were already in, in Afghanistan. Uh, we are um, not good multitaskers, really. Uh, 
we try to do multiple things at the same time, but our foreign policy usually revolves around one issue at a time. Because of those decisions in 2003 and 2004, a war in Afghanistan, which should have ended in 2005 or 2006 with victory, is now dragging on in 2014 with no end in sight. And the prospects for victory are pretty slim. Uh, the prospect is for uh, stalemate is much more likely. Um, as I said early in my comments, I think we know a lot of the things we need to do. We seem to have difficulty in figuring out how to go about doing them. Uh, I, I had a question um, that was, uh, you know, you were asked in 2008 to help coordinate the uh, administration's policy towards Afghanistan and Pakistan. Where do you think we stand as far as Pakistan is concerned today? Okay. I actually want to answer for both Afghanistan and Pakistan. Let me start with, with Pakistan. Mm. We've put Pakistan on the back burner in the last four or five years. I would say ever since we found out that Osama bin Laden was hiding not in a cave but about 500 yards in front of the Cockrell Military Academy. I think for understandable reasons, a lot of Americans came to the conclusion they're not on our side, therefore let's just ignore them. That's an understandable reaction, but it's a foolish reaction. Pakistan is one of the most important countries in the world today. Uh, it has, it will soon be the largest Islamic country in the world in terms of population. It sits at a strategically vital place. It is at the cornerstone of India, China, and the Middle East. It is a country which has exported many, many people to our own country, where they have been one of the most successful ethnic immigrant groups in American history. And on the other side, it's also the country with the fastest growing nuclear weapons program in the world today. It is the fourth largest nuclear weapons state in the world today, bigger than France, bigger than England. It is a patron state sponsor of terror and a victim of terror all at the same time. Unique, really. There aren't very many who fit into both of those categories. And I would characterize the President's policy as getting off to a very, very good start. If you look back to 2009 and 2010, there was barely a day that a member of the American cabinet wasn't in Islamabad trying to coax, push, pressure, cajole, sweet talk, you name it. Now, they never go. It's like they gave up. That's not a policy. Giving up is not a policy. This country is far too important to just to ne to neglect. I'll give you another example. Prime Minister Modi's visit to Washington. Did we hear anything in that visit about promoting better relations between India and Pakistan? Now, Modi may not be the perfect person to do that, but in other ways he may be, be the perfect person to do that. He's the Nixon go to China kind of guy. Are we putting any effort into encouraging him, cajoling, sweet talking, you name it, for him to do something on that front? I don't see very much of it. Let me turn to Afghanistan. If in 2003 we had made a modest effort to build an Afghan army that would be large enough to deal with providing security for the country, we would be long gone. We would have left there five years ago or at least 99% of our forces would be gone. We didn't. The previous administration, the Bush administration, adopted a policy that they would build an Afghan army only as large as the Afghan economy could support. Now when you think, of, when you hear that first, yeah, that makes sense. Why would we build an army bigger than the economy could support? Except that Afghanistan doesn't have an economy. It has no economy. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. Most of its economic Wealth is generated from selling drugs, and drug dealers don't usually pay taxes. That's not part of the business of being an illicit seller of drugs. So by 2009, we were on the verge of catastrophic defeat in Afghanistan. We came very, very close to 
for the Afghan Taliban taking over the city of Kandahar. They were this close back in 2008 and 2009. Finally, eight years after we should have, we began building an Afghan army. And that's what we've been doing for the last five years, building an Afghan army. It's a gamble, believe me. I told this to the president in 2009. The chance of success is 50-50 at best. Having neglected it for so long, now trying to build an Afghan army that can work, that can stabilize the country, is a big risk. We are now coming to the moment of truth. We're going to find out whether the gamble works, whether the Afghan state and the Afghan army can hold together in the face of what will be enormous pressure, I suspect, from the Afghan Taliban in the fighting seasons in 2015, 2016, and even more in 2017. One other thing about Afghanistan, though. There is a great deal of fatigue with this war in Afghanistan, understandably so. One way to think about it is this way. Compare the Afghan war to our civil war. If the, ver if the start of the Afghan war was 9-11 and the start of the civil war was Fort Sumter, and you compare the two, we would now be at the end of the second Ulysses S. Grant administration and still fighting the South. That's the, a, a good way to think about it. But we have made accomplishments here. When we went into Afghanistan in 2001, in the days after 9-11, less than 100,000 Afghan children went to school. And not a single one of them was a girl. Today, nine million Afghan children are going to school this morning, today, and half of them are girls. That's a pretty big accomplishment, something we should be proud of, and something which we should make sure endures after most of our troops leave a few years from now. We had two questions over here, Dr. Muzaffar and this gentleman. And see, Bruce, can you take three? Yep. Why don't we take three and then I'll ask, and I'll try to answer all of them. Great. We will get to you, sir. Uh, Bruce, my name is Afan Muzaffar. You just mentioned in the beginning that, um, you know, part of the reason that you have this um, continuous flow of extremism in the Muslim world is the U.S. policy towards the Palestine Israel. Um, but then I look at this festering sectarian problem in the Middle East, in Iraq, and also spinning over in, in Pakistan and other parts of the Muslim world. And you see this struggle going on between the Saudis and the Iranis. And um, what has that got to do with your policy towards Israel? I, I, I don't understand. If you could just say a bit more about that. Go ahead. Uh, <coughs> my name is Doug Johnston. Uh, Bruce, a uh, hypothetical question for you. And it, uh, complements what was just asked. Uh, if the Palestinian uh, and Israeli conflict were to be resolved tomorrow, what would you expect to see happen? Can you pass the mic back? Thank you. Bruce, I'm Steve Engelkin. Um, we still have a lot of money in the aid pipeline, not expended for Pakistan. And given the educational theme of this for a moment, how would you recommend we use that money that has been appropriated? We've got it uh, in a way that would further, our, you know, uh, our goals in Pakistan. Let me start with the last and, and, and go forward from that. Um, there are people in this room who know a lot more about aid for Pakistan than I do. <laughs> um, she should really answer that question uh, much better than I can. Um, my one comment would be, uh, I would rather see a thousand small projects than some big project with the American name on it. Um, big projects, of course, always inspire uh, political leaders. They can say, look, I built this dam, I built this highway, I built that. Um, I think those are better done by the private sector, by and large. I would like to see smaller projects. Education, I think, is a particularly tr thorny place. 
Um, you can imagine if uh, uh, the United, President of the United States tried to convince uh, the voters of, uh, let's say, Louisiana that we should let the government of Pakistan come in and look at the curriculum. <laughs> Ooh. Um, I think we're a little toxic on this issue. Let's not kid ourselves. Um, America's approval rating in Pakistan is now with so low, it's within the statistical margin of error. 100% of Pakistanis may hate the United States, not just 3% of Pakistan, uh, 100, instead of 97% who do. Second question about the Sunni Shia. You're absolutely right. Um, in conflicts in the Middle East, what is so uh, difficult about them is the multiple layers of complexity. Uh, we have, we have uh, conflicts between the uh, outside powers, and indigenous powers. We have the uh, conflict uh, proxy wars between players, Saudi Arabia and Iran being the, the most uh, uh, prominent one. We have the issue of um, radical extremism, al Qaedaism. All of these problems flow together. The Sunni Shia conflict is not really susceptible to a made-in-Washington Judeo-Christian solution. Um, I'm reminded of, a, of an American mediator in the, in the early days of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict who actually said this. He brought the Israelis and Palestinians together and the Israelis and Arabs together and said, now let's just reason as good Christians about where we're going to go from here. Um, it, it don't work that way. Um, what I think we should do what I think we have neglected is speaking out more forcefully about the issue of sectarian, the encouragement of sectarian violence. Some of this sectarian violence is undoubtedly encouraged by the Iranian government on the Shia side and by the Iraqi government on the Shia side, but an awful lot of it is encouraged by our allies, particularly the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I'm increasingly puzzled as I think about our strategy in Syria, that we want to create a moderate Syrian army which will build an inclusive political system uh, that will live in an era of no winners and no losers in Syria. And we're going to train that army in that bastion of tolerance, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I don't exactly see how we get from A to B in that case. Let me come to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's not the solution to the problem, okay? If we solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict along just fair and lasting lines, Al-Qaeda will oppose it. Because Al-Qaeda doesn't want a just fair and lasting solution. It wants to destroy Israel and it wants to destroy any Palestinian and any Arab who has worked with Israel. Ayman Zawahiri got into the business of being a terrorist. Why? Because he wanted to kill Anwar Sadat because he signed the Camp David peace agreement. So we're not going to eliminate or undermine, eliminate or destroy Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaedaism by settling the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. What we are going to do is create a situation in which we start drying up support for them. If we have a Gaza war every other year, think of how many young Muslims we are going to antagonize and send into the arms of Al-Qaeda, the Islamic State, Hezbollah, whatever you name it. This is a, a conflict that has gone on far too long, which today includes one of the largest uh, concentration camps in the history of the world, the Gaza Strip, uh, which today routinely violates the human and civil liberties, not just of Palestinians, but increasingly of any Israeli who's critical of his government. Historians will look back a century from now and say, why did they just let this simmer? Why did they just let it go on and on? Why didn't they do something about this? Osama bin Laden um, issued a statement immediately after 
the so-called underwear bombing. You remember that, the uh, Nigerian who uh, had a bomb in his uh, shorts who tried to blow up an airplane descending over Ontario into Detroit on Christmas Day uh, 2009. The statement he said afterwards was about 50 words long. And he said it simply. He said, this will continue as long as you continue to support Israel. That's it. That was it. They have told us this over and over again, and yet we seem to be impervious to recognizing that this is obviously for them a vulnerability. They want the conflict to go on in perpetuity. It is not in our interest, it is a national security interest of the United States to find a just, free, fair, and lasting settlement. You're right, it won't dry it up overnight, but it will make it a much easier political battle for us if we can say, look, we actually have helped to liberate Palestine. I think we had one more question. I'll let you go in the back, and then we will let Bruce go on with the rest of his day. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Sabra Qureshi, independent consultant. Um, we've, uh, there's been a lot of discussion on the need to look at the South Asia region as a region and solve the problems of that whole area within a regional response, a regional strategy, but somehow we haven't seen all of the, those regional players come together or talk to each other. So just a question on what exactly is being done towards that end, and within the context of the education theme of this conference, is there anything that is part of the U.S. strategy that looks at um, perhaps better or greater exchange between the various countries, knowing how you know, the bilateral situation between Pakistan and Afghanistan or Pakistan and India, et cetera, and if there is more of facilitation that can encourage more dialogue right. and something along the effect of a curriculum for peace and tolerance or something like that. I mean, it's just those are the kind of things that we need to start talking about a little more if we're going to inculcate that uh, level of peace and tolerance in the younger generation. Um, there are lots of things that we can do. One of them, for example, would be to close Guantanamo. Not just talk about it, but actually do it. Uh, peace curriculums, uh, outreach to the Islamic world. Again, to be fair to the president, you know, I voted for him twice, and I think he was the better candidate both times. I think he came into office realizing all of these things. I think, unfortunately, the political side has atrophied. Organizational question. Well, you're preaching to the converted. Um, I'm frequently accused of having thought up the idea of AFPAC. I did not. That was not my idea. I think it's a stupid thing to say. I think it's insulting to Pakistanis. Um, the only thing I can say to you is it almost got worse. In the very first days of 2009, we, the Yemen situation flared up, and there was seriously talk about creating a YAFPAC. Yemen, Afghanistan, Pakistan, but then somebody realized that would just be ludicrous and the whole world would be laughing at us. The virtue of AFPAC was the recognition that you cannot resolve the Afghanistan situation without dealing with the Pakistan situation. The downside of AFPAC is, of course, that you cannot resolve the Pakistan situation without resolving the Indian situation and without thinking about the problem of Kashmir. Uh, I know I may be uh, lost in space here somewhere, but Kashmir is a constant source of friction in this part of the world between two nuclear-armed countries. There are firefights going on on the line of control now virtually every day. This is a very disturbing development, and yet the American media has completely neglected it. We do need a holistic approach. Um, the State Department, oddly on this issue, has done better than most. Uh, they actually created a South Asia Bureau um, back in the uh, first Bush administration. Actually, it was an accident. Congressman <laughs> Solars pushed for the creation of a South Asia Bureau. The State Department wanted to veto the legislation, and I have to take some small credit. I convinced Brent Scowcroft that it was really silly to veto the State Department uh, annual authorization over whether or not we should create a South Asia Bureau or not that that would be a pretty hard sell to the American people. 
The military is the worst because the military, which is the big uh, elephant in the room in any American national security decision-making process, divides the subcontinent uh, down the India-Pakistan border. India is worried about by people in Honolulu, and Pakistan is worried about by people in Tampa. Uh, other than having great places to live, that doesn't make any sense to me. I've long advocated the creation of a new U.S. military command, the South Asia Military Command, and I would put the headquarters for that in that garden spot in the Indian Ocean, Diego Garcia, which I think would encourage them to work harder so that they could get the hell out of Diego Garcia as soon as they can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> We're going to move to the afternoon panel. Fosia is taking over as moderator. Thank you. Just going to walk you out. Okay, getting on with our program for the afternoon. Wasn't that uh, a real from the heart talk by Mr. Bruce Rydell? I, I think we, we should applaud him even though he isn't here. That was really, really good to hear. Very few people are as honest as he was, and that was good to see. <laughs> Um, uh, I had made some opening remarks this morning, and I think it's um, important to repeat some of them again this afternoon since we have some new faces, new people joining us now. And as people are trickling in again, um, uh, I was at fault this morning. I did not effectively turn off my cell or turn down my cell, and I was the first one to be embarrassed. So please don't join me in that gaffe if, if you can avoid it. Um, we again thank our presenters who were so forceful and effective this morning. We had a very healthy discussion on many issues, and I wish we had more time to accommodate more questions and more discussion, but, you know, time doesn't wait for us. So uh, with that, uh, I thank, on behalf of uh, the Wilson Center and TCF, I thank our afternoon speakers. Uh, the three speakers will uh, do individual presentations, their individual talks, and then be a, a panel at the end of their uh, speeches. Uh, there are no changes in the agenda. We will follow that as we go, and we will take a mid-afternoon break, I think uh, just before the panel um, uh, reconvenes. Uh, we followed a Q&A format this morning, which we would like to continue. If the volunteers could make sure that we have sufficient number of Q&A forms, please, and distribute them. Uh, the planning team feels that it, it is more effective if uh, we get questions on a written piece of paper from, from the audience. And we will do our best to accommodate some questions from the floor as well. But written questions really are the most efficient way of conducting a forum like this, so please work with us on that. Um, other than that. 
Okay. If we can distribute them, please. Um, you know, anyone who feels like uh, they will possibly want to uh, raise a question, please raise your hand, and uh, Madiha or Barbara can help help you get a form. Uh, just a word about TCF. TCF stands for the Citizens Foundation. As you came in, you may have seen some information at the table um, before the entrance. And uh, the Citizens Foundation, is a, uh, Citizens Foundation is a nonprofit based in Pakistan that supports education. We started our work in 1995. One of the co-founders of TCF uh, and the current chairman of the board is Mushtaq Chopra, who's here with us at the head table. And uh, TCF passed a major milestone just this year of building, or rather having, 1,000 school units. That was the goal that the founders thought would be a reachable goal in a few years, and 1,000 schools it is. We are over 1,000 schools and still counting. We have 145,000 kids in our schools. We have 7,700 teachers, professionally trained women, all women who teach at our schools. So I could go on bragging, but that's a, a good teaser. If you'd like more information, please walk up to the table and uh, pick up some more, or find one of us and we can brag some more. Uh, the purpose of this education reform conference is obviously, as, as uh, Bruce Rydell referred to, is the crisis in Pakistan. And among the many challenges, education is one of the most serious ones. Uh, so this education reform conference, sponsored by TCF and co-hosted by Wilson Center, is the first one, and we envision this to be a continuing series of conferences. We are already in the works planning our second one at UC Berkeley in February of next year. And we may have a few more with the last two in Pakistan, in Lahore and Karachi. Uh, we will have a dedicated website which is being developed. The proceedings of this conference and subsequent conferences will be hosted on that website, along with other information and resources relevant to education reform in Pakistan. And that website itself will become a, a major resource for all kinds of information sharing, as well as the wealth of information that, that has been gathered over the last decade or more. So uh, we, since you are signed up for this conference, we know where you are and we will find you by email and let you know about the website. Uh, the next thing I want to do before I sit down is introduce our moderator for this afternoon. Uh, let's, she isn't here, but really Aisha uh, uh, Chaudhary did a wonderful job this morning uh, as moderator. She was uh, in the hot seat for some time during the panel discussion. Everyone wants to ask my question and uh, we, we uh, sorry we couldn't accommodate everybody. So please be patient with the moderator as uh, she is going to have a tough job again, perhaps. Uh, but our moderator for this afternoon is Fawzia Saeed. Fawzia has a PhD in education from University of Minnesota. She has worked as an activist uh, for women's rights in Pakistan. Uh, she's a Pakistan fellow at um, the Wilson Center at this time, and uh, she has worked also in the past in curriculum development with the Higher Education Commission in Pakistan. So here's uh, Fawzia, and she will introduce the speakers and uh, moderate the program. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be a part of a program uh, which is sponsored by or hosted by Wilson Center and the Citizens Foundation. And I have been, as a citizen, and also a citizen who's very interested in education, visited several of their schools in the remotest part of the country. And I must say that it, has, it was really uh, a pleasure to visit them. Uh, talk to the students, talk to the parents, I've talked to the teachers. So it was quite, uh, it is quite a phenomena. And I must say that uh, not enough bragging has happened yet. 
I want to just add one thing that uh, recently they have been given an award, a very prestigious award, which is Maksai Sai Award. And for us who live in Asia, it's almost kind of our own uh, Nobel Prize. And it has been given to a Pakistani organization or even an individual after a long time. So it's a matter of great pride. I must also say that uh, things have opened up in Pakistan in the recent, I would say, five, six years. And there are enormous potential uh, to make a big difference in the field of education. So in this session, we are focusing on um, opportunities, lessons, how can we learn from experiences of other players globally, and how can we learn from our own past experiences and experiments like the Citizen Foundation, like many other organizations who are doing wonderful work in education and have made a concrete difference. So how can we scale that up? How can we uh, apply the learnings to an educational reform in Pakistan? So for our first speaker, I would like to introduce Dr. Lisbeth Steer. Um, she is a fellow at Brookings, affiliated with the Center of Universal Education. She has a PhD in development economics and about 20, 20 years of experience uh, with educational systems of developing countries. She has focused on successful models also. And here we want to uh, utilize uh, her experiences uh, from Bangladesh because Bangladesh is part of our region, South Asian region, and has done wonders in education. So we are requesting her to share the learnings of Bangladesh uh, and the consequences of positive lessons for Pakistan so we can learn and uh, try and uh, carve out reforms for Pakistan. And I think you will be using a presentation, so you would come here. Thank you. Stand and do it. There's a. Great. Thank you very much. It's uh, wonderful to be here, and I've been really enjoying this discussion, um, partly because I am not a Pakistan expert, so I've been learning a lot, and I should say that before I start um, my presentation. Um, I'm actually also not an education expert. I'm an economist, so I look at things from that angle. Um, so excuse me if I look a little bit number-focused. Um, what I will bring you today is um, some work that we've done at the Center for Universal Education on um, financing mainly of education and how actually these goals that countries set themselves with respect to quality and equity, how they actually can also mobilize and direct the resources to achieve that. So this is part of a bigger research program that also covers other countries. So Bangladesh has been one of the countries. So it's a little bit of a specific angle to things, so I hope it, it will be useful nonetheless um, for, for this discussion. Um, Bangladesh has struggled with many of the same issues as Pakistan. It's um, tried to improve access, especially for girls. It's tried to improve the quality of its education system. Um, it's focusing very heavily on equity issues and reaching marginalized uh, communities. It's also developing a system um, of, of education provision. Um, and in, in somewhat in, in contrast to, to Pakistan, it's still heavily centralized. It's actually wanting to devolve and wanting to decentralize, but at the moment, it's still a very centralized system. So um, one has to keep that in mind. Um, now, the, the Bangladeshi government really um, has the intention to provide uh, basic education um, to provide that through the public sector. Uh, that is very much its intention and it, it wants to realize that. Um, so we're going to look at how um, they are doing that, how they are trying to achieve that goal. So uh, I want to start with kind of what the achievements have been and, and kind of what the intentions have been of the government and the progress made. 
So first of all, um, I think we should emphasize the incredible uh, uh, prioritization and consistency in policy um, around education in Bangladesh. This already started, um, and it was laid out in the constitution, the right to education. Um, they have a number of uh, documents that set out where they want to go with their education system, including um, in a national education plan that sets out to establish an integrated school system, primary education being the responsibility of the state, um, they would like to extend primary ex education to eighth grade. They want to uh, focus on quality and they want to decentralize. So that's all set out um, in this national education plan. They also have a, a primary education um, development uh, plan program that actually is really a sector-wide program that's supported by donors. And there's a lot of uh, coordination around sort of a, a, a fairly strong kind of agenda to um, achieve universal uh, primary education. Again, within that plan uh, or program, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, reaching the marginalized, um, on bringing in new uh, ways of, of doing that. So um, the system, what it is consists of today, um, there are um, a whole set of schools um, in the system. This, this gives some uh, indication. There's about 100,000 schools, um, and um, it, it is a whole variety of it. Before 2013, about, um, you can see that on the right, 60% of students were in what's called the government system. The rest were in um, non-governmental schools of various uh, sorts. Um, they either were through the madrasa, their NGO schools. Um, there's a category there that's called the non-registered, um, um, the registered non-government uh, primary schools. And those are the ones actually that now the government has absorbed into its system. So in 2013, they made the decision to uh, take about 20,000 schools into their system. So they've really wanted to nationalize the provision um, of education, and that's uh, quite important um, to, to recognize. They have all these types of schools, and they have a school census that tries to keep track of all this, which is quite amazing. There's a lot of data around about different uh, types of schools, which has helped us analyze uh, what's going on. Um, in terms of support to the different schools, so the government schools are fully government run, fully government supported. Um, other types of schools get various levels of support. Sometimes it's 80% uh, of teacher salaries are paid. Sometimes it's uh, some stipends that are given, um, could be free textbooks. There's all sorts of variations in the support to the different uh, schools. Now, uh, Bangladesh has made an enormous progress in terms of uh, increasing access. Um, as you can see, since the 1990s, they've basically gone up from about 80% um, uh, gross enrollment rate to now above 100, it's uh, 115 or so. Um, they actually, in contrast to other uh, uh, countries in the region, you can see Pakistan as well, um, they have done really well. So on the access front, I think they are really recognized as a leader in the region. Part of this was actually not only because of the government's precision, but of, of their embracing of the NGO sector and the way um, NGOs have helped to actually uh, achieve this. Um, you may all be familiar with BRAC. Um, they are recognized as being a real player in this, providing um, non-formal education to uh, poor children and marginalized children, and actually um, providing a bridge between the, the outer school and the formal education system. So they try to get children into the non-formal education and then they transfer into uh, formal education. And that has been a real success. So in terms of lessons learned, looking at that uh, could be
be quite um, useful. Also, it doesn't only, um, it's not restricted to BRAC. They have other innovations, for example, using um, boat schools to reach uh, um, river-based uh, river communities um, to provide education there. So a lot of very interesting examples there. One other thing the government um, has really done, which is quite impressive, is it has realized that um, providing education to poor children costs more. And it will uh, need, uh, more effort will be needed to overcome some of the disadvantages that um, these children face and the costs of uh, providing education in more remote areas. So when we looked at spending patterns, um, and we've, we had to kind of make some assumptions on this because the data isn't great, which I will, I will come to. When we looked at spending patterns per student, we found that in poorer areas, so if you look at poverty incidence on the x-axis, in poorer areas on the right, the expenditure per student is greater, and the dots uh, represent sub-districts. There are about 500 sub-districts in, in uh, Bangladesh. So you can see that actually spending is, is greater when it comes to uh, poorer districts, which is a real achievement. In many countries we have looked at, it's often the reverse. Spending, uh, there's more spending on uh, students in richer uh, districts. One of the things that has really helped achieve this is the stipend program, which is also um, something that Bangladesh is, is quite famous for. Um, this is a cash-based program uh, which was where, where cash incentives are uh, being given to poorer children to go to school. Um, there are a lot of um, kind of peculiar peculiarities about the program which, which have made it quite uh, successful. So um, looking at that experience again as to how it was done is, is really, could really help in the, in the Pakistan context as well. So, but... Uh, to talk a little bit about lessons learned and where we go. Um, Bangladesh has made great progress in getting children into school, which I guess uh, to some extent Pakistan has been doing as well. But the access hasn't equaled, hasn't equaled schooling. And what we mean by that is, um, first of all, children don't stay in school, which is also, I, uh, I understand, a big problem in, um, in Pakistan. The government has actually set itself some really great targets. So, for example, the red line in this graph represents the target the government has set in with respect to dropout rates. They want it to be less than 20 percent. Um, the graph re represents the number of districts that are not, are or are not achieving that target. And what you see is that basically most of the districts are not achieving that target. Um, in fact, sadly, um, the poorer districts are doing much worse. So the more you go to the right, those are, tend to be the poorer areas. So dropout rates are still much too high. Um, that means a lot of kids are out of school. Again, we can see when we look at the sort of poverty um, distribution of children out of school, tend to be the poorer children that are out of school. Some interesting work done by UNESCO trying to sort of compare uh, that. Now, of course, the other thing is the learning issue and the quality of education um, is really poor across the board. Um, what you see here is that only 25% of children are reading at grade level. Only 32% of children are doing maths at grade level. This is for grade five. Um, that's what this graph represents. And again, if we look at a distribution of this, poorer children are doing much worse than uh, rich, uh, richer children. So what we did is to try and kind of look into what, what's going on here, because the government is really spending more on poor children, is really trying to make an effort to get those children into the system, what's going on. Um, and we looked at a number of indicators uh, to see uh, kind of what's underlying that. And I'm just going to give you a few examples, but there's a lot more detail in the report we did on this. So the first thing is um, overcrowded classrooms. The government's done a, made a lot of effort to make sure that there are schools in various areas. And the number of schools per, per sort of thousand population is actually pretty good. 
But then when you start looking at the number of kids that are in these uh, classrooms, we see this huge overcrowding. So um, if we look at the red line again, which is a government target, but also the international standard with respect to how much space each child should have around itself, um, we see that the average room size is way, way uh, too small. And again, uh, it tends to be um, a problem in, in poorer areas as well. Again, um, going to another input, uh, teachers, it's been mentioned before, um, there is a, a real shortage of teachers and a shortage of qualified teachers. Um, again, the red line represents the, um, the target of the government. Here, actually, quite a number of, of Upazilas are actually above, uh, the, the Upazilas are the districts, are above the target. Um, but again, uh, are below the target, I mean, because this is the average student-teacher uh, ratio. But if you look at those that have, tend to have too many children per teacher, again, we're looking at poorer areas. The other issue, um, I should mention Bangladesh, you may be aware of that, has done a tremendous job getting girls into school. They are recognized worldwide for this. They are going to be reaching the MDG on gender equity. Um, kids have been getting into school, they've managed to enroll girls, but what is happening is that the environment uh, for those girls isn't conducive uh, for them to stay into sc in school and to learn. This is just one example we heard earlier about the issue of female teachers. Again, the government set ex itself a target to have 60% um, of teachers to be uh, female, but a lot of the districts are not reaching that. And so the question is to what extent is it really an equal sort of environment for girls? So um, when we look at all this, we try to f figure out what is it now about this spending pattern and the resource allocation of the government that has led to this outcome and this sort of um, uh, suboptimal outcome. The first thing is, and I think this is certainly also a lesson for uh, uh, Pakistan because you see it's right next to Bangladesh, the overall spending on education is just way too low compared to other countries. The UNESCO actually has set um, uh, an, an, a target for this, that a country should spend about 6% of their uh, GDP on education or 20% of their budget. Now, Bangladesh is not reaching any of these. It's spending about 2% two, two of the GDP on education and just above 10% of its budget, which is far too low. So it needs to up that. Somehow, the prioritization in its, in its government documents isn't translated in its budget. Um, uh, also, primary education isn't getting enough attention within the budget. Another issue is that because the, there's not enough spending um, from the government side, households are supplementing this. Um, and so there's a lot of spending from poor households on, um, on uh, education. One of the ways the government has been trying to incentivize those households is by giving them those cash incentives. But what we see is that the value of that, um, of that incentive hasn't been adjusted over time to inflation and so on. So we're seeing that actually if it was worth 100 in 2003, uh, it's only 50 now um, in uh, 2012. So the, the effect of that will have to be uh, considered because it's, it's, much, uh, it's much less worth uh, today. Now, this is also an interesting um, thing that we found, is that even though in the budget, when you look at recurrent spending, you see that um, it is pro-poor, um, uh, when you actually look in more detail at um, the capital spending um, that's going on, you find that actually that isn't so pro-poor. So again, uh, there's been some good news on one side, but not so good news on another side, and the two have to work together to actually uh, give you the outcomes you want. So this shows on the left-hand side, you have the infrastructure indicator. It shows that um, infrastructure in, in poorer areas has basically been much worse, and again, that affects um, the fact uh, whether kids will be in school, how they uh, uh, perform and so on. 
the other big issue has to do with the whole system um, and the way the budget is organized I can we can go into this in the, in the in the question and answer but even though the it is a proper allocation the transparency around the budget and the formulas used to allocate the budget are actually not needs based which is kind of a, a conundrum um, also the the whole system is very complicated, it has two different ministries, all the deconcentrated units, then you have all these providers, so the government's really trying to rationalize that through its nationalization. This is a really big point and I would like to connect it to, and I'm getting to the end here, to the, the, the conversation this morning, that is that there's just too little information on the link between resources and outcomes, and that is why I think the roadmap idea is so powerful because governments will need to know what their resources are buying and how much of their resources is going to which areas. Here you see um, we looked at kind of an out, a number of outcome indicators and uh, linked them to expenditure per student. You kind of see a positive uh, um, uh, sort of line, but it's really a snowball. It doesn't really give a very clear picture of what's going on. Plus, this isn't actually related to learning uh, data for which we didn't have enough detailed data to, to look at this. So moving forward, um, some sort of final uh, points on this. Um, we, Bangladesh needs to increase its overall funding. I think that can be said of Pakistan as well. Um, Secondly, that, that the way this funding is targeted needs to be really looked at. I don't know what the, the arrangement is in Pakistan, but at the moment the allocation within Bangladesh, even though you have the stipend program and certain programs are needs-based, the overall budget is not needs-based. And there is a lot of experience um, internationally around funding formulas and how actually budgets could be allocated weighing for uh, special needs and particular needs. Decentralization is a big uh, topic on the agenda. It is very much needed because the evidence shows that to achieve quality, you need to be have much flexible, uh, uh, much more flexible systems. And that can only be done if you have a decentralized approach. Um, the demand side funding, even though the stipend program has been massively successful in getting kids into school, there are some questions about whether actually that's now the right approach now the kids are in school and we need to think about quality. Could that money be more usefully spent on supply side improvements, perhaps? And then the final one, I think I would support everything I was said this morning around the data. Um, we need to have data as a start to look at anything, really. Bangladesh has collected a lot of data, but at the moment it's not presented or used in a way that really can help policymakers to make uh, decisions. So that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I think good analysis in this time to be able to present lessons like that. Thank you. And we will add these as contribution to our larger discussion as we move along. Um, I think policy, you mentioned policy and persistence in, in following that policy, very important. And that is why I think in Pakistan with the constitutional amendment and educational policies with the provinces, uh, are seen positive steps because one cannot move forward without these mega uh, sort of plans in place. Now I would like to invite Dr. Douglas Johnston. Uh, he has a PhD in political science from Harvard and is the president and founder president actually of International Center for Religion and Diplomacy, uh, also a graduate of Naval Academy and I must mention uh, some of his publications, Religion, Terror, and Error, U.S. Foreign Policy and Challenges, Challenge of Spiritual Engagement, uh, Religion, the Missing Dimension of Statecraft. And here with us, uh, he will share some of the lessons from Madrasa Reforms. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be with you today uh, on <coughs> addressing such important topics. In 2004, 
uh, our center, the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy, undertook a program to reform the madrasas in Pakistan. Uh, now, few in the West are mindful of the illustrious history of these religious schools. But back in the Middle Ages, they were without peer as institutions of higher learning, and indeed it was only European exposure to them that led to our own university system in the West. And you would be absolutely uh, astounded at how many of the traditions and mores of academe uh, trace their roots back to the madrasas, uh, the mortar boards and tassels you wear at graduation, the, you know, funding a chair in a given discipline. And it shouldn't come as a surprise because they were the model. We've just sort of forgotten about that. But then under the influence of British colonialism and fearing the possible loss of their Muslim identity, uh, they retracted. They purged themselves of all disciplines that were thought to either be secular or Western in orientation to the point where the vast majority today are about rote memorization of the Quran and the study of Islamic principles. Now our goals there have been twofold. One is to expand the curriculum to inc uh, include the physical and social sciences with a very strong emphasis on religious tolerance and human rights, particularly women's rights. And second, possibly more importantly, is to transform the pedagogy to create critical thinking skills among the students. Why that's so important is you can have these students uh, who graduate uh, and have memorized the Quran from cover to cover uh, are pretty clueless as to what it means because they had to memorize it in Arabic and their first language is Urdu and they haven't gotten near enough Arabic to understand something as sophisticated as the Quran. And along comes a local militant to re re recruit them to his cause. And uh, these kids have absolutely no ability to question or to challenge. So uh, that's kind of the state of play now. And uh, with respect to engaging the madrasas, at this point in time, uh, we and the indigenous successor organization that now has the project have collectively uh, engaged some 20, let's see, it's 4,500 madrasa leaders from about 2,500 different madrasas. That sounds like a lot. It's not. There's about 20,000 altogether, but most all of these were in the radical areas, and we have great confidence that there's sufficient momentum to uh, take this across the entire country. Now, uh, why have we had success in doing this? And I think this would be among the lessons learned. Um, there's really three principal reasons. First is ownership. We've conducted the project in such a way that the uh, madrasa leaders feel it's their reform effort, not something imposed from the outside. And by the way, over there we don't use the word reform, we use the word enhance. And in light of their past history, it makes a lot of sense. But if you just believe what you read in the newspapers uh, about the madrasas, you would con conclude that they were nothing but bastions of terrorism with a sort of a caveman-like mentality that prevails. And nothing could be further from the truth. There's certainly some of them that are, do have a jihadist agenda, that's for sure. But there's also a lot of good ideas that come out of them. And for example, the lead paragraph in our teacher awareness module in our workshops was crafted by a madrasa leader. And I'd like to just read it to you. It's, it's short. It says, I have come to a frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element in the classroom. My personal approach creates the climate. My daily mood makes the weather. As a teacher, I have a tremendous power to make a child's life miserable or joyous. I can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or humor, hurt or heal. In all situations, it's my response that decides whether a crisis will be escalated or de-escalated and a child humanized or dehumanized. Uh, frankly, I would be hard pressed to come up with something half that good. This is from a madrasa leader. So uh, they do have a great deal of ownership in the change process and, and it's working. The second ingredient in the success, lesson learned if you will, is uh, um, the heritage. We inspire them with their own heritage, not only of the schools themselves, which I just made mention of, but going back to the early days of Islam, when many of the pioneering breakthroughs in the arts and sciences, including religious tolerance, took place under Islam at a time when Christianity was woefully intolerant, I might add. Third, possibly most importantly, is we ground all suggested change in Islamic principles. 
so they can genuinely feel they're becoming better Muslims in the process, and they are. Um, a fourth, which I don't mention often, but when I do it's sort of blown them away, is the fact that uh, our center operates from a posture of total humility because we're very mindful that the United States was very complicit in planting the seeds of jihad in the first place in the madrasas in order to grow holy warriors to evict the godless Soviets out of Afghanistan. And uh, indeed, uh, USAID led a contract for $92,000 to the University of Nebraska to, to put together textbooks for those madrasas. And you read these things and it would make your hair stand on end. So the Soviets left, then we left, and uh, the madrasas, uh, now we're back, and the madrasas are doing what we trained them to do, only they've changed targets. So one more uh, illustration of the law of unintended consequences. Okay. So uh, now let me just sort of bring this alive for you. I'll, I'll share two very brief anecdotes with you. One was, uh, you may recall, when the Taliban had taken over the Swat Valley, which is sort of a resort area in the mountains of Pakistan and uh, heads were rolling all over the place and we had a workshop underway for 16 madrasas surrounding the Swat Valley. Toward the end of the workshop, one gentleman who was a madrasa leader stood up. Turns out he was also a commander in Lashkari Taiba, the terrorist group that brought you Mumbai. He said, um, I came here for one reason and one reason only. It's to discredit everything you have to say. He says, but I'm now standing here in front of you full of rage. Rage because for 26 years I've studied and taught the Quran the way it was taught to me. He says, for the first time in my life I now feel I have experienced the soul of the Holy Quran and its peaceful intent. He said, I now see that the right way to advance Islam is through peace, not conflict. I'm going to change what I teach my students and I'm going to tell them why. Well, uh, very brave words to say in mixed company in that context. And this is one of the things that's really blown, blown me away is that once you penetrate the veneer of hostility and rage and engage these folks, not only do they get it, but many of them become champions of what you're talking about at great personal risk to themselves. Um, we came back a month later and uh, he was doing exactly as he had said he would do. And we had a CNN team with us. They'd been after us for several years to document our work. Uh, and he said on CNN, for God and the entire world to hear. I think he finally figured out he was on thin ice. He says, enough, enough, you know. But, uh, but this, is, this is indicative of the kind of uh, change that one can find. Another uh, interesting, there, there are countless anecdotes, but just one more was in one of our workshops, uh, one of the participants was a Taliban commander of some renown. And he was quite despondent because he'd lost two, two sons in the fighting. And he said, you know, we, we don't know what America wants. You come after us with guns, we've got no recourse but to respond in kind. So this led to an invitation for me to come to the mountains to tell their leadership, their leadership what uh, America wants, which I did two months later. In the meantime, I made the rounds at state defense and the agency to make sure whatever I said was consistent with U.S. policy. And I'm here to tell you it's not only the Afghans in the mountains that don't know what America wants. Um, but uh, so uh, up in the Malican agency, I go into this compound. It's owned by a gentleman who supposedly uh, gave sanctuary to bin Laden right after 9-11. So it's up in the heart of darkness. It's a stone's throw from the Swat Valley. Um, and I walk in this room, there's 57 Taliban commanders, several tribal and religious leaders. And um, I started out by just telling them, I said, look, uh, we're not a government organization, nor have we ever received any funding from our government, which was true at that time. Uh, I said, and why we're here is to see if we can build upon religious values that we share in common to create a confidence building measure that can point toward peace. And I said, for you to be able to participate in this exercise, you need to understand the Western perspective. So I told them what America wants, which simply put was to lay down their guns, distance themselves from Al-Qaeda, and to reconcile with the Karzai government. Um, that then segued into two and a half hours of uh, dialogue. Uh, a lot of venting went on. Uh, it was clear from the looks on some people's faces that some were less pleased to be there than others. 
uh, but these, most of them were Afghan commanders who had come across the mountains for the, the border for this, uh, this meeting. And uh, I just, there were about a half a dozen very penetrating questions that emerged uh, over that two and a half hours. I'll just share one of them with you, which was, why are we attacking Afghanistan? And I said, well, to put it in terms that you hold dear, hospitality, loyalty, and revenge, before we recognized certain members of al-Qaeda as a threat, we welcomed them into our country. We gave them hospitality. Then, without warning, they struck on 9-11. We wanted revenge. So we went to the Taliban government, asked them to turn over the al-Qaeda leadership so we could bring them to justice. They refused, so we attacked. I said, but we did so with a heavy heart, because most Americans are, have great admiration and respect for the Afghan people, stemming from our common struggle against the former Soviet Union. I said, furthermore, it's important for you to understand that now some of your tribal leaders are banding together against al-Qaeda because they have violated your hospitality. Well, uh, at the end of the two and a half hours, we broke for prayer time, uh, came back in a smaller group, and came up with a confidence-building measure. But one other very interesting moment in that two and a half hours was uh, one very rough-looking gentleman stood up, and he pointed his finger at me. He says, I can't talk to you unless you become a Muslim. And I thought for a second, I, see, I, don't, I said, I don't see a problem. I said, Muslim means submission to God. We all submit to God, therefore we're all Muslims. So everybody laughed and we went on with our business. But, but uh, later, my project director, who's absolutely superb, by the way, and, and deserves 90% of the credit for all the work we did over there, uh, he and our Wahhabi indigenous partner, who had spent the better part of a month rounding these folks up, they got pretty uptight at that moment because the standard scenario is you convert or you die. And of course, I was totally oblivious to that. And I thought, boy, the Lord really does look out for fools and incompetence, you know. So, um, but um, uh, we, the confidence building measure called for uh, establishing a secure zone in the western third of Nuristan, which was the Afghan province right across the border. Uh, where there wasn't much activity going on, but to, to facilitate private development uh, there because these, all of these uh, uh, Taliban commanders seemed to genuinely care about the plight of their people. They were all mortified that of all the billions of dollars flowing into Afghanistan, none of it seemed to be making its way down to the village level, at least at not, not at that point in time. So this would be a way to try to finesse that. Well, it failed because I couldn't get NATO to buy in on the secure zone. But where it paid off was several months later, I received a call from the Korean ambassador of the United States asking if there was anything our center could do to help uh, secure the release of 21 Korean missionaries being held hostage by the Taliban. And uh, we were able, because of the networking associated with that earlier meeting and all, we were able eventually to play an instrumental role in getting them released. So, so that, that had a happy ending. Um, so that, that gives you, that, that's the sort of anecdotal stuff. Systemically, uh, we, early on, we started, I say early on, it was probably at about the five-year point, we, we engaged universities. Uh, got some funding to facilitate universities training madrasa leaders. We'd go in and we'd train their faculty, and then they would train the madrasa leaders. And so that was going on and, and, and producing good results. Another systemic factor was we created a model curriculum for the madrasas. I say we, again, it's that ownership piece. We used madrasa scholars as we did this. And it was to create a curriculum that was based on best Islamic practice, uh, best educational practices from throughout the Islamic world. And one part of that, in trying to determine what that might look like, we took the National Madrasa Oversight Board. These are the five religious leaders that sit on top of the five sects that sponsor these schools. We took them to Egypt and Turkey to see how they handled Islamic education. And frankly, they went with a bit of an attitude. You know, what can these secularists teach us religious purists? They came back very humbled because they found that not only could Egyptian and Turkish students handle religious questions every bit as capably as any Pakistani madrasa student, but they could also handle contemporary questions, uh, the math, the science. They'd had all the right uh, courses, if you will. So they came back and they made a decision. Henceforth, all madrasa faculty are going to be certified. And so this really institutionalized this uh, university piece that I was talking about. And they brought together 
uh, a half a dozen of the best of the best of their uh, madrasa uh, uh, teachers from all five sects for us to give, take them through an eight-day kickoff effort with that. Um, I'm getting the hook, uh, so I'll try to bring this to a close. How much time do I have? One minute. Okay. All right. Uh, just, uh, I guess, in terms of lessons learned and difficulties along the way, uh, at one point, we, we knew we were somewhat targeted by the extremists throughout, but at one point, uh, uh, and I couldn't believe the timing, I sat down with our project director and I said, look, I said, it, from this point on, I don't want to ever mention our center's name in Pakistan again. I said, we're too widely known and we're too targeted. Three days later, out comes a seven-page online jihadist journal article uh, that uh, went to all the cells in Pakistan and Afghanistan, specifically targeting our work, accusing us of, quote, venomous concepts like tolerance, moderation, women's empowerment. They had us pegged. And uh, uh, so what we did, fortunately, we had lay two years earlier, we'd put in place the legal framework for an indigenous NGO that we would one day staff up and pass the baton to because our job is always to work ourselves out of a job by creating capacity, not dependency. So we energized that, took our project director, let him go, made him the president of that uh, uh, new uh, indigenous NGO, and uh, staffed it up, uh, uh, moved our, our director and his family to Dubai where he could be close enough to, to do the job, and, and uh, the momentum has continued unabated. And in fact, uh, another interesting thing is that uh, for the last five years of that seven-year period we were involved with it, uh, our State Department uh, was not supportive of what we were doing. Uh, the embassy was not supportive, not only not financially, but even morally. You know, I, I never figured out whether it was church-state separation concerns or if it was just politically too hot to handle trying to support the idea of Americans working in Pakistani religious schools for whatever reason. But then, at about the same time as we made, made this transition, a contingent came over from State Department and sat down and said, we want to we wanna develop our strategy around your work. And these were the CVE folks, the Countering Violent Extremism folks. And what they finally recognized was that the work that we were doing with the madrasas, dealing with the ideas behind the guns, if you will, was every bit as strategic, if not more so, than anything else that was going on on or off the battlefield. And I just submit to you, if you want to drain the swamp of extremism, uh, you, can't, you can't do it with the bombs and the bullets. They, they have their place, but they just spawn more terrorists. But if you really want to drain the swamp, you, you do deal with those ideas behind the guns. Uh, you will find that winning hearts and minds is contagious. And that's sort of, uh, I have so much more to tell you, but I have the hook, so thank you. Okay, we will have our last presentation of this, uh, this panel, this sec section. And after that, we will go into the panel discussion. So just a reminder, if people want to ask questions, there is a, sh a sheet around. Yeah, it looks like that. And you can fill it out and pass it on to this end. And I think there are volunteers that can take that. You could just kind of show your question sheet, and somebody will pick it up. Um, OK, I would, I'm very happy to introduce the next speaker and also a friend, uh, Bela Jamil, whose commitment I think all the Pakistani citizens know in terms of um, helping out, pushing education reforms. And um, her education uh, has been mostly from the Institute of Education, University of London. And she has been an education activist associated with Idara Talimu Agahi. And she was also a former technical advisor to the Ministry of Education. <laughs> and has worked a lot on public policy, pushing public policy. So you're one person, I think, Bela, that who would, um, who would appreciate how important it is to have good policy in place. <laughs> and also, I've seen her labor through her activities, trying to make teachers enthusiastic about education process. I think things are very different when you're on the ground and 
actually trying to create opportunities for exposure to the teachers to bring in creativity in the classroom. So she has not only focused on policy issues, but also access and quality issues. So we are very happy to have you speak. Um, good afternoon. It's a, It's been a long day and uh, very intense and diverse, but I just wanted to first of all acknowledge uh, the Citizens Foundation, the admiration, admiration for which, uh, I mean, I just think that this is one institution that we can be so proud of and um, want to replicate, you know, as uh, far and wide as we can. Um, so it's a, a real moment of uh, admiration and, uh, uh, you know, uh, humility for us to be standing in front of uh, all of you here who are here uh, as friends of TCF uh, taking the message forward. Um, but I think uh, in my, what I'd like to say today, and I know uh, how to also wake us up, um, you know, after the lunch and very exciting uh, presentations that we've had, is that we have to look at education really as a game changer and with it that, and that has to be a passionate belief. And with that, to look at the whole area of gender in education, and gender in particular, as an accelerator to that. I think it's important, and my friend Gordon Brown said the other day, very rightly, that look at education as a modern civil rights movement. And I think that's what we have. How do we become civil rights activists? We've been living this and working from the trenches, but I think that's sort of, uh, what I wanted to be able to start off with, um, to share with you. So um, basically, just quickly taking you through some of the global conversations that are taking place around the Millennium Development Goals and the post-2015 agenda, looking at some of the evidence from uh, Pakistan's uh, and data. What does data tell us? What is the story that we can piece together? And then moving forward, and I hope I'll be able to spend more time on that. So just, I mean, the business of MDGs, it's an unfinished agenda. We know that 57 million children are out of school for Pakistan. It's important because a lot of them are there also, just as they are in Nigeria. And a lot of them are affected by conflict and exploitation. We know that 250 million children are not work, not learning anything. They're in schools, but not learning. This is all GMR data. And we know that of the 774 million illiterate women, uh, people in the world, two thirds are women. And we know that resources for education, we know that this is a tough one to mobilize resources for education. My friend Mushtar Chapra Saab knows that. Everyone here in the TCF board knows that. It's not easy. But look at the way the six goals of education, if you're looking at how do we measure after 15 years, it's only 450 days left to the end of MDGs, where are we headed? And if we look at goal one on free primary education, so the greens is what says that we've sort of met the goal. And the reds is where the alarm bells are that we're very far from the target. Well, Pakistan is very far from the target when it comes to primary education, lower secondary. Amongst those, these are global, globally the data, but we are still sitting very far away. Pakistan is somewhere quite a lot over there. But look at the primary education uh, gender parity and the lower secondary gender parity, and that is looking very promising. And so some of that could be also uh, a bit elusive. So Bangladesh or many countries maybe be, you know, have gotten to gender parity, one which is good, but does that mean all girls are school? No, it just means girls and boys are equal if they, you know, in a particular country. So we could have very low indicators and still have that. We look at South and West Asia, that in terms of the number of children finishing grade four and learning, well, we're not even one fourth of the distance. So that is a very big challenge globally. But look at the Millennium Development Goals and what's coming after that. 17 goals and 169 targets is what we argued just a week before at the UN General Assembly. A lot of buzz going around. And look at the kind of, so from eight we jump to 17, and if we look at them by and large and cluster them, it's ending poverty, nutrition, health gains, um, quality education, gender equality, empowerment, water, energy, economic growth, reducing inequality, environmental protection and resilience, peaceful, just, and inclusive society, 
and how do we strengthen our means of implementation and resource mobilization. Now, so everything is there, and there's a lot of argument going to go on till next year, but I wanted to bring you to this point that no matter how we look at it, if we look at the issue of girls and women's education, and each one of these targets or goals is really about education and women. And, and we feel, that's why we say education is the game changer at the end of the day. It is that cross-cutting um, uh, indicator that will make a difference to, to everything. And I think that, I think somewhere has to be the fix that we want to fix today so that we can take things forward in a lot of enthusiasm. We also know that having primary is not enough. Secondary is when things begin to matter. So when we look at issues of stunting and mother's education, at primary level, perhaps they can make a difference to 4%, but they have secondary education, and you'll see reduction in stunting to 26%, and so on. And similarly, in terms of saving children from stunting, it's a secondary education which is critical. We look at marriages, and we look at you know, with primary education only, we feel that uh, the child marriages can be delayed to 14%. But with secondary education, it is 64%. So I just wanted the audience here and people who are going to become, the people who will talk about it, the communicators, that primary education, no matter what World Bank study said once, they change it like the American policy keeps changing. Well, secondary education is very critical for being a game changer for education. And so far in Pakistan, we've only focused on primary. We've been obsessed with primary. We haven't made schools which should have been elementary in the first place. So with the result, we've sitting, like in SIN, 91% only primary education schools. On, out of those 91%, 72%, only one or two teacher schools you know, essentially, so what do you have? And only 5% middle and 3% secondary. Well, you know, your goose is cooked. That's why SIN data looks very bad and very worrying. Worse than even FATA, worse than Balochistan in terms of learning levels. People who were there, you know, in, a, in the uh, UN General Assembly, the people like the Minister of Norway and people who walk the talk, like Gasha Marshall, they basically sp spoke the same thing. Get your children into school, but more than that, girls matter. And girls are the ones who are going to take everyone along. We know that. TCF knows that. How do we look at, how do we build this argument with much more finesse than we've done so? I won't talk about this uh, 25A story because we've talked about it, but I think what I'm going to give you at the end of this, and I hope everybody can have it, is to be able to look at the act and we think the act is important. However, how, uh, the devil is in the details. I'm not going to spend too much time on this also, but if you look at enrollment by gen level and gender, and you look everywhere, so you look at Punjab as a great success story, essentially, both in early childhood, you look at any uh, the primary level also, and we're taking the six to 10 age group, but look at then Balochistan, look at uh, the areas where there is clearly a problem. And I would like, and this is the whole business of data. When you're looking at data and how you're targeting your strategies, you be, need to be able to look at it. So here comes the issue of the, um, the gender parity index. So we've seen an improvement, and when we see improvement, we must acknowledge it. So we've seen improvement in primary education, uh, up to 0.9 almost, and we have to get to one. We can, if we really are. Uh, are serious about it, but look at the story of secondary education. No matter how, now PSLM data gets, takes place, this is the Pakistan Social Living Measurement Survey data, this is collected at the household level. So whether they are going public or private school doesn't matter, or madrasas and so on. But look at the big jump in secondary education going to 0.9. So from, even from 11, 2011 and 12, it was 0.81, it's gone to 0.89. Something to look out for, that's what the people want. That's what the girls want. That's what, when we see learning levels jump. You get the girls up to middle and grade eight and see them in eight and they flower. But before that, they are all oppressed. Again, Balochistan is a big challenge for us. Talking about Asar, 
the annual status of education report, and I wanted to speak because this is really, if you're going to talk about the civil rights movement, well, then this is it. And how it began with an, a pioneering idea in India, how it came to Pakistan, because we formed the South Asia Forum for Education Development and said, let's share the good things happening. And we shared, we went across, they came across, and then there's no looking back. But it is a citizen's movement. 10,000 young volunteers uh, gather on $5 a day for two days a year to collect this data after three years, three days of intensive training. Young people. And the idea is how do we collect evidence which supports both demand and supply? It wakes up people who have been sitting with inertia thinking that the state is going to deliver something on their doorstep. And basically, this is a wake up call for them for households to know that, did you go and find out, you know, you've been sending the child for eight years, she hasn't completed a primary, what is she learning? Is she learning anything? And the tool is so simple, so it provides data, it informs local and global policy and national policy. So it's been extremely influential because it's not just taking place in Pakistan. The methodology is being repeated in East and West Africa, India, Mexico, and I hope Nigeria will join, will join, and we have more than half the world covered through this amazing methodology, which is a two-stage stratified sample. It is a random sample. It goes into households, 600 households per district, and for the urban sampling, we use the PSLM, and it has grown. This will be the third year, consecutive year, which where the whole country will be covered. So almost 263,000 children covered, 87,000 households, and volunteers keep multi Simple tools. Simple tools, looking at grade two level competencies, only for arithmetic, perhaps grade three early. And it's simple and it's oral and it's in the household, so it happens on a holiday. And then there are tools which also measure the household's information, so we can have proxy indicators for wealth and we can generate more nuanced data and also look at the schools in the neighborhood, in the village, or the uh, urban blocks, so that a public and a private school now and so that we have better understanding, a triangulated understanding of what that child is learning, how it is learning, what household it comes from. But when the data comes and we begin to look at it and we're looking at how it's showing, we begin to see a very interesting phenomena. We are beginning to see that in the early years, actually, if you notice it quickly, that the gap between girls and boys is not much. It means that parents are sending everyone to school, and then they get depressed, right? They get depressed. But almost every child, in, and sometimes at age three in an urban, you see more girls going to early years <coughs> program than boys. And then, and we may, are seeing also in Pakistan this narrowing of the gap. So there's always not bad news. There's plenty of bad news. <laughs> but it shows that, you know, as I was saying to somebody, the Voice of America lady there, that listen, the good news is everyone wants education because they know that that is how they improve the quality of life. So that means we have reason for optimism. But then what happens to the service is where our problems are. And we are looking at still that girls do not have access when it comes to primary, both in urban and rural areas. And when it comes to learning levels, and this is simple stuff, and when we are looking at uh, this test, it's a very floor level test. It's a dipstick test. You know, so I don't want to really over overestimate its importance, but even at that level, what we are seeing is that, you know, a simple recognition of letter, word, sentence, para, story, or number, um, you know, addition, subtraction, uh, division, Simple stuff like that, and English or Sindhi or Balochi or Pashto or whatever, we're seeing that girls are not being able at this level. And this test is for six to 16 year olds. And when we test them, and every child locking in the house who's from six, or six to 16 years old, that person, that's, they're tested. So we're looking at urban areas, the, the gap is narrowing. And then I just wanted to share with you this uh, World Inequality Database in Education, it's a nuanced way of being able to see how the poorest are faring, how the girls of boys are faring, how the girls and boys are faring of the poorest quartile versus the richest and so on. There's no mu not much time. Uh, the time has been cut, I suppose. Other important people took it. 
But anyway, um, <laughs> this is not that interesting. I've been given two minutes. So I'm just going to go. So we, so, but basically, this kind of um, uh, gender and wealth asset analysis also lets you know where there's low hanging fruit. So if you see that 53% uh, girls are out of school in the poorest quartile as compared to 20%, well, that's where you do something. And we're going to talk about what we do. Uh, and this is the persistence of gender gaps in learning. And I suppose it will be there. You can see it. But also something that we often forget. We are not having enough teachers, female teachers at primary level. And this is a story from latest data that we have only 38% versus 62% teachers, males versus females, because essentially, and look at it. So in SIN, there are only 27% female teachers. This is now only in public sector I'm talking about. In Baluchistan, 28%. And suddenly, Islamabad, you have 72% female teachers, and so on. And overall, we are seeing 38%. Now, the problem with primary education is because the model is flawed. It's two teacher, two room. That's how the government approves the scheme, that means there are hardly any teachers to teach six grades with just two teachers or one teacher, or if you're lucky, three teachers, or very lucky, then four teachers. And if one teacher's not there, you're perpetually in a multi-grade situation, not being trained for this. I won't stop at that, but remember, and I mean, Fozia is here, and she's a real activist working on this, but our problems of gender are not restricted to learning and education. They are because of a deeper challenges of conventional uh, of worst forms of exclusion, child marriages, child labor, trafficking, conflict, and they are suffered disproportionately by girls. And so I'm not going to again talk about the data, but we are seeing the issue of child marriage becoming big. We're seeing the, uh, the uh, invisibility of child domestic labor, the worst forms of child labor still not declared so under law, although SIND has just passed the Child Marriage um, uh, Act which is a good news, but of course, the, again, the rules have to be made. Stories of girls who said, you know, no one thought about my happiness and sorrow. My father went and put me at eight, eight, uh, 10 years old in a, in a home. I expressed this interest to my father that I want to go to school, but nobody took notice. And this is Samar Minala writing on the 29th on Facebook. <coughs> happiness is when laws are being enforced. Today in court, Sudan, Rahim Yar Khan, following a media report highlighted on Geo, two minor worlds, was saved from getting married as Vani, which is, do we know, is, uh, is uh, essentially in, it is to, to, in exchange for murder, for anything committed, and the girls are offered as sacrifice. And so moving forward, issue is we have to address issues of education and learning, but we have to do it through worst forms of exploitation exclusions. They are adversely affecting girls, child marriages, trafficking, worst forms of child. And Pakistan is part of a global campaign. What can we do? How can we mobilize parliamentarians, teacher unions, youth, media, judicial system? And special programs be created for this. And unless we do not do that, the laws on right to education, now if 25A were to take place, we wouldn't have this problem you know, the way we have it now. So we need to go beyond advocacy to action through partnerships with enabling policies, laws and rules, <laughs> resources. But I just wanted to say, and I'm ending it with the, uh, one more slide, and the issue is we need to rewrite this narrative on girls' education. Because I think we keep on thinking of gender as an issue of girls and women, and their education is one sector story. I'm arguing again and again that edu girls' education is not the business of one sector. It belongs to every sector, and we need to mobilize investment on this. And not, and not thinking of education for girls and education per se as a long-term affair with long returns, whether it value for money, you know, this is rubbish. You have value for money this instant. Mm -hmm. Ask Mr. Chabra, ask anyone who's seen girls being educated and how they influence, and we've seen that. So it is not so on all counts. How do we ensure and get our policymakers and our society to look at education as, as the problem of health sector, nutrition, population, environment, all of them. And these, we feel, that is, leads to impact, not as externalities, but to everyone that's around in the family and the community. So we need to plan concurrently at all levels. Don't think of just planning for primary. You can plan for secondary. You can plan for technical vocation. You can plan for bridge programs. And we need to reconceptualize this. The financing is critical. 
Now, if you think it like that as everybody's business, that we will be, and I'm the great one, Baniya of education, I love pulling money from different sectors. Mm -hmm. And we need to be able to pull this so that we have education not just taking happening because of a health education initiative, but because of a health initiative, or a nutrition initiative, or a human rights or an urban development initiative. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so important, but we need to come up with programs which are designed for different age groups who have left the system, come in or left, or not joined the system at all. And I think on technical vocational innovations, but we should not give up on innovative financing. I know ICRA did a bad deal on us, but we need to come up with more innovation and innovative financing tools. And I want to end up that in order to be able to do that, we need partnerships again and this grant alliance for education and gender and health and economic growth. The government, enterprise, industry, civil society, and youth. But it needs a high trust factor. That's what's missing. Because you need it in order to be able to share the risks, resources, accountability, and outcomes. I think it is very important that we need to also learn the best practices of scaling up. But my last point is opening learning kiosks, which are which have technology and creativity, creativity enabled. They can be 12 hours, 24 hours, 36 hours, 72 hours, 150 hours learning immersion experiences. This is called banking for learning, education and empowerment, and we need to link them to other services, not abandon these kiosks just as education kiosks, but learn li link to other services in health, nutrition, microcredit, reproductive rights, employment, enterprise, economic growth. We can do it, we'll measure it, and we can celebrate it. I just wanted to let you know that there are resources and websites of all the critical documents that some of you may used to influence policy at multiple levels, both here and in Pakistan. Um, and there's several other um, pieces, but I hope that will come in handy. Thank and you very I much. The laws are on this website. Yes, all the laws. Thank you. Thank you. Bela, you are the most exciting, enthusiastic, and important person in this room. <laughs> and why not? We will celebrate you every day from now on. Questions? All right. Volunteers can pick up more questions. Uh, we'll make a, a little uh, change in the program, and rather than break for coffee, since uh, Bela was so effective in waking us up from our nice lunch, why don't we go to the panel, do the Q&A, and then take the coffee break and decide what we want to do next. Is that okay with everyone? Yes. Good, okay. So that's what we will do. Uh, Fozia, do you have any other announcements or just the, the questions? Okay, I'll give you the questions in a minute. Any more coming up? Okay, here's the first question, and it's all yours. Okay, this is directed to Dr. Douglas Johnston. And the question is, when you went into Pakistan with Madrasa, with uh, Madrasa reform, um, how closely did you work with the Pakistan government, uh, or private sector, or NGOs? When we uh, went into uh, Pakistan to uh, initiate this uh, madrasa reform project, uh, we kept our distance from the government uh, of Pakistan. Uh, the reason being that uh, President Musharraf uh, at about that time came out with an edict that he didn't want any foreigners uh, messing around with the madrasas. And it was understandable politically because uh, you know, the MMA had uh, two out of the four provinces were under their control, which is re the religious uh, uh, elements. And so we, we kept our distance, and we, but we continued doing what we were doing, which uh, would seemingly violate his edict for sure. Uh, what happened then over time is we got to the point where we were having such an impact that we uh, recognized that the government was going to find out about it. Uh, so we felt that uh, better they hear it from us than from someone else. 
So one of the things we did was we invited a, the a contingent of the, uh, the National Madrasa Oversight Board from Pakistan to the United States and included the secretary to the Minister of Religious Affairs as part of that delegation. And this began a courtship in which they came to eventually be very supportive of what we were doing. Uh, did not get in the way, d didn't provide funding, but, uh, but uh, they, they were supportive. Uh, which was uh, interesting because our own government uh, wasn't at the time. But um, one thing I will say I, 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 that bears on all this is the elephant in the room that nobody talks about is the fact that despite its democratic trappings, Pakistan is fundamentally a feudal society. And the people on the top are not only not interested in empowering the people on the bottom, they want to keep them there. And this is one of the reasons why they're percent of GDP de de dedicated to education is so parse. It's near the bottom in, in the entire world. Uh, Bangladesh, I guess, is a competitor, but, uh, but uh, it's almost deliberate to try to keep people illiterate so they can't vote and thereby upset, upset the apple cart. So that's a, it's a, there, is a, there is another question which is linked to that, so I would just add it to your response. Um, what about women in these groups? Mm. Uh, the number or the role? Mm. You know, uh, when we started out, uh, the, the, the female leaders of girls' madrasas asked us to do for them what we were doing for the male madrasas. Uh, but the males uh, wouldn't hear of it, you know, so we didn't do it until after three years, uh, so somehow the males got around to asking us to do the female madrasas. I guess the women had been working on them for a while. <laughs> and, uh, and anyway, we. We did that, and uh, of course, as you might imagine, the women get it twice as fast as the men. And uh, I remember one quote that, uh, uh, this is a very poor paraphrase, but it was something to the effect that, you know, you can work with the male madrasas till the cows come home, but if you want change, talk to us. We, we, we control them. <laughs> I, I, thought, okay. I thought some things are the same the world around, you know. So. Thank you. Uh, I think we will open up questions and we'll take them from the floor, but I want to I want to keep it focused on the objective because this is the last part of the whole day conference. We are looking at reforms and we are looking at what can we do to uh, make education a game changer, right, as you put it. So any, any suggestions or specific questions? I have already asked you. Okay, you can raise your hands. Sorry, go ahead. I, I couldn't hear you. I couldn't hear you. year when your project started? 2004. I, it took me all of 2003 to raise the money to get it, get it going. And has it extended? It has continued. Uh, when, we, when we left and turned it over to the indigenous NGO, we had engaged some 2,700 madrasa leaders from 1,600 madrasas, and now that number is up to 4,500 from 2,500. So we, we didn't miss a beat. It, it, it continues on, but it's really enhanced the security of it to have the overt American link cut. About two and a half years ago. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. You have a follow-up? Yes. Um, when, you, when you ask, I, I think my question concerning ladies, women, my question was specifically ask about uh, if terrorist group like Lashkar Taiba, for example, recruits women or not, no matter the level of education they have. That is important to know because sometimes in those countries where women do not have access to education, they don't consider them now. I have heard here that they are, the number is growing in schools here. So are they going to consider them just for recruitment to send them abroad or not, no matter the level of education? That was my point. Okay. You think you have answered? You have any idea? I do want to make the discussion a bit broader. Do you have anything more uh, yeah, specifically, me. or and you want to answer? No, I, I, I wanted to ask questions. I, I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> okay. I, I really don't think that's the topic. Of this. Yes, I, I want to take it a bit broader because yeah. we are talking about educational yeah, reforms I, I in Pakistan. I had a question about education. Okay, and then after that we'll come there. 
My question is to uh, you and Baylor, and that is uh, in the morning session we talked about uh, adopting schools. And uh, I have, s you know, talked with people with two different models. You know, one is the model where you go in and you take over the whole school, uh, which is the adopt a school model. And then I've talked to the people from Pratham in India where they uh, don't take over the school, but they get permission to go into the government school and teach three or four subjects. Are you guys familiar with that? Do you, what do you think the value of that is compared to adopting schools? Uh, is it more economic uh, way of doing things? Okay. Yeah, my experience is also more of Sindh, but why don't you start and then I will also answer. Um, in Sindh, I don't know if you know, but um, <coughs> I was asked um, for four months, we worked on the amendment to the Infrastructure Act that Irfan was roughly referring to to include services and those uh, after a very heavy consultation that was given and then we did a consultation on adopt a school policy and we've made amendments to that and given it to the government to enhance it so that it goes from a low authority high responsibility low autonomy model to one which is of high autonomy but also more resources. Right now, the, the government given, doesn't give resources. So on the one hand, we are asking, why don't you open up this model to multiple models, but where the government gives a per child cost so that it's more sustainable and adopters such as the TCF comes in. But TSA, TCF doesn't have to look for money here, there, and everywhere. After all, the government is spending almost 1,700 rupees per child at primary level, almost 6,000 rupees per child at secondary level, and not getting any, and sometimes spending as much as 70,000 rupees per child at secondary level per month when there are only four children and seven mm -hmm. teachers. So the question is that the government has to have this flexibility and give a per child cost to someone who wants to come up with a better model of improvement of quality. The second issue is on Pratham, on the um, Read India program, they go into a school, they have X number of uh, they can go for a year or six months, work on the improvement of learning levels through the Read India program, as well as give libraries. And that's just to focus on that with a volunteer or two from the area. It's a very, uh, what should I say, it's a very straightforward, focused model. I don't know whether it always succeeds or not. I think schools definitely need a bit more stabilization in Pakistan, because in India, they have free meals, they have free uniforms, they have transport, they, and still they're not producing quality. So the quality challenges are big there. But I don't know whether in Pakistan we can take that risk of a simple no fringe, just going for short. I mean, that's my take on that. Uh, because of the issue, because of the problems of schools in Pakistan, which are slightly different in terms of the so interventions. Per child. Per child. Yes, and of course there must be a way to to oversee it to make sure that it is being done right. But otherwise, this uh, philanthropic model is a very unsustainable model. I may have it today, I may not. I do that work as well. But I think from Idara Tali Mahadevi. But that's a big challenge because what happens when the resource and we are doing we are helping the government. That's what I'm saying. The Grand Alliance has to take place. Okay. Okay, I will make a comment. Um, I have seen schools where, uh, where the government sees the success of some organization handling their own schools and they say, why don't you take ours too, you know, from that. And so the organization can work with that for a while and it may not really be persistent enough to continue forever. Um, I think these are good initiatives to see what works, what doesn't work. Uh, these are not the ultimate options. Uh, adopt a school is a bit more comprehensive because you totally uh, adopt that school and you carry it forward. Uh, I think that the essence is in the successes and then building up on it towards a more sustainable systematic uh, system. So we'll take some more questions and please be short with your questions and short with your responses so that we can engage quite a bit over there. Ji. Dr. Johnson, my name is Shehrbanu Berki. My question is um, about the madrasa reforms that you were talking about. And given your background in the armed forces, 
how much influence can you have on madrasa reforms given the fact that the finances to these madrasas, the pipeline brings in a Wahhabi influence that you do not have any control over, neither you and nor does the government. So how successful are madrasa reforms in Pakistan when the finances that are feeding in a certain mindset are the ones that are not being stopped, whether it's Wahhabi, whether it's coming from any other influence. And have you been able to have any success uh, in that area? Uh, we, we have been able to have success, and it's in spite of the reality that you uh, spoke about. And uh, we've had madrasa leaders that were, uh, you know, madrasas that were explicitly tied to terrorism, uh, and we've had the leaders, you know, as we would talk to them about, you know, doing things differently, and, and they buy into it. And in fact, uh, we just, you know, we're, we're, we've just established uh, teacher training institutes in uh, the anchor madrasas for the, uh, the five sects that sponsor the schools, if you consider Jamaat Islami a sect. Uh, and uh, w the father of the Taliban, Ihsan al uh is sending 50 madrasas uh, for this, t this training institute, and the institute is specifically going to be training a peace textbook that has been, uh, that has been developed uh, with the, uh, the support of, uh, of uh, madrasa leaders. Uh, that uh, it's all about peace building and conflict resolution, and so they're coming. And the uh, the business you're talking about, uh, the vast majority of the madrasas are actually funded locally through zakat. Uh, but you do find some of the Gulf money, you do find some of the uh, the Saudi money making its way into Diobandi schools and Wahhabi or Ali Hadith schools. Uh, and we've had uh, madrasa leaders just say, you know, give us an alternative, you know, like their hands were somewhat tied. But there's some momentum in this, and it's, it's sort of catching, uh, you know, the, the, those, those hearts and minds that have been won over, kind of persuasive. So there's a tension. There's a tension, to be sure. Uh, okay. I, I just want to add that uh, when it comes to madrasas, uh, they, there may be a tangential connection with the education, but it is a much larger issue. Uh, we don't see them as one alternative to education because these are more like shelters. Uh, and Pardon me? Yes, and, and there is a, a very um, heavy baggage of uh, political interventions and international interventions, so I don't think that a few a uh, few comments here can <coughs> suffice. Uh, one yes. uh, I, I would in, take in exception with your characterization. In our work, uh, we are now working with madrasas for just like school improvement, and we are now uh, screening some madrasas to start work with them and take them as part of the mainstreaming process. And I would urge many people, even TCF, to test some because there have been very successful stories of having mainstreaming matriculation and madrasas and also technical vocational programs and madrasas by Tefta in Punjab, for example. So I would urge that, you know, please don't treat them separately. In our ASA survey, we have found only 2% children going to madrasas. And basically in Balochistan, where there's a huge shortage of schools, more madrasas there, but not necessarily of the extremist kind. They're the ones who use the government strategy of madrasa reform and mainstreaming much more than anybody else. So I think let's not think of every madrasa being as a haven of evil. Or treating them all the same. That's what I'm saying, that educational part is separate and then where you have a lot of other activities is, is a separate no, phenomenon. No, that, that's, not, that's not quite, quite, quite the case. And, and let, me, let me give you one other example of exactly what you're saying. In our first university training program was in the University of Karachi, and we had 29 so, sort of the best of the best that uh, came from the Karachi surrounding madrasas. Uh, and uh, uh, each one of them at the graduation, certification graduation 12 weeks later, uh, brought their fathers. And these were all the sons or the stepsons of the leaders of these madrasas, many of them very hostile. And, and they took such pride when they walked through the university gates, you know, I mean, because they feel insulated, isolated, looked down upon, and they largely are. Uh, but when, they, when there's this s sort of notion of acceptance, boy, they really come alive. And I think this is probably one of the best keys to mainstreaming the madrasas. Uh, despite the government's failed attempts in the past. I think it can happen. Okay, thank you.
Yes, uh, no, wait, sorry. I have uh, a couple of others. Uh, Sabra, you, and then you, and then you. So we have three comments coming, and then we'll have the panel answer them collectively. Thank you, uh, Sabra Qureshi, independent consultant. My question is actually addressed to um, any of the TCF team here today. And I, I was just wondering, we've heard a lot since the morning about um, the success of TCF's work and also a lot of other successful models out there, non-governmental, that are working fine and delivering high quality education. And, but at the same time, we've also heard that it's important to strengthen the public sector because eventually it is the government's mandate in any civilized society to deliver basic social services. So is there any, a, a, and apart from the adopt a school recommendation we heard, which is one way forward, does TCF have any plans to go as they move forward to be on the policy table with the government as a representative of the civil society sector or the non-governmental sector, whether it's for profits, small profit, large profit, to try and, as they move forward, develop policies that can also can look at several models, pilot different models, and uh, sort of be a voice for the civil society sector that is doing a lot out there in the field and find ways of partnering. There isn't one single forum in Pakistan today that can bring together a lot of these different models and initiatives and be a forum for learning as well as give a voice to the civil sector at the policy table. Can I take a couple of more questions? Uh, there was one, yes, over there. Uh, yes, this question is um, for a couple of people on the panel. Uh, my name is Amna Ali, I'm a journalist. Um, firstly, to Dr. Johnston, could you identify, just out of curiosity, the NGO to whom you've transferred um, your work or who's doing your work for you now, you mentioned earlier? And also, ideally, who should um, take ownership of madrasa reform uh, in Pakistan? It is, I, as Fawzia said, it's a larger issue with um, a lot of ramifications. But ideally, in an ideal situation, um, who would take that ownership? Thank okay. You. We'll have one more question. Over here, please. Right here. My name is Salman Asim. I'm an economist with the World Bank. Uh, my question to the panel is in terms of like, we've been talking on about the issues of the role of like bypassing the state in like through the low cost private schooling options. Uh, but what has been missing in the discussion has been that, that if we have to make greater strides in student enrollment and the quality of learning, when immediate intervention is on the governance side, mm -hmm. because most of these countries have like very huge public sector system. And even if we give hope on the system, the system is going to stay and continue to exist. So in terms of like, uh, Nisbet, your experience of researching on the Bangladesh, what are system strengthening reforms on the governance side that have been implemented? Have they been implemented or is it kind of like bypassed to kind of like meet certain number targets? because that is very popular when we talk about like international development. And secondly, Bela, your experience in terms of like working in Sindh, I find like there is a huge variation in the public schooling system. So out of like the 40,000 primary schools, there will be 10 to 15,000 which are performing quite better than the remaining 20 to 25,000, which goes back to kind of like earlier comments on the social action program and how these schools were created in the 80s and the 90s. So how are we going to cope and fix with these problems as we absolutely. go forward? I think we need to discuss a bit of history of the schooling system in order to get the policy questions right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, if you allow me, I will field these questions to different speakers. Um, the first one, can I ask um, Mushtaq Sab if you want to? Answer that. And the forum question, Bela, maybe you can supplement uh, the part that if we have a forum for all the sectors. 
Savra, you uh, uh, come up with a very interesting sort of uh, 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 question, interesting uh, situation. Citizen Foundation, as you know, had a headache, uh, a program in front of it. The milestone has been achieved. And people want to know more about what we are going to do next. Now, in the whole, whole scenario, Citizen Foundation has al always been involved in sharing the expertise, sharing what we have learned over the years. It has been, you've heard Saad speaking in earlier in the morning. We have always maintained that what we have learned is the wealth of this country, and not only in this country, anybody else who wants to benefit from our experience is more than welcome to sort of, I was in a conference a few months back, and I spoke to a couple of NGOs from Africa, because the problems uh, are probably the similar, or the same in, in, in the third world, and, in, and, and uh, enrollment or gender balance, these are all issues which are just the same, uh, with a little bit of uh, difference. Now, having said that, we have already embarked on a very ambitious sort of a program where uh, Daniel briefly mentioned about this quality improvement project. Obviously, our domain is Pakistan, our domain are the villages and the slums of Pakistan, and we have started intervention into the uh, for-profit, we haven't been successful with the, with the, not, uh, with the public uh, sector schools, but we have had a very successful pilot with the low-cost private schools. We have had a, a pilot which had 70-odd schools which have been given books and uh, the curriculum which we have sort of improvised, and we have trained their teachers, and so on. You must have heard about this Humera Bachal, you know, the girl, uh, Madonna, is funding the uh, schooling system. Just to give you an example, she uh, sort of, uh, we, we approached her and she came, came up to us. And now in that school, in March Court, there are TCF books which are being taught to the children. We have trained their principals. Princ uh, there is a couple of uh, principals because there's a primary, pre-primary. So what I'm trying to come to is TCF has not done uh, enough on advocacy as you would, you, you have just uh, mentioned. But we feel that, that there is the next possible uh, avenue which we have to work. Because there are a lot of good models uh, around. There are a lot of good initiatives in that country. And we need to have more uh, in sharing of information, more sitting down and discussing uh, things. And probably, you know, so, but, but other than that, we have really embarked on a very, you know, we want to take this program. If it is, you've seen it's a successful program. We want uh, millions of children to benefit out of, you know, because there are 70,000 uh, not f uh, low cost, not for profit schools which have come up uh, in the last 10 years. So this is the kind of uh, mindset, this is the kind of scenario which TCF is working. And obviously we are not letting off on the, on the uh, uh, well, I won't call it the adoption model, but the interventional model of TCF into government schools. We are having advanced discussions with KPK and uh, they are almost, they've agreed on, uh, uh, as a pilot game, uh, sort of, uh, uh, putting to sample about 100 schools in five districts of Frontier Province. So uh, this is the general outlook, and I take take on the cue from here and maybe work more. Yes, Amjad, you want to say something? Aaron? Amjad Nurani, I would supplement him. Yes, I'd, on behalf of TCF, I'd like to add to what Mushtaq just said. As we are planning more dialogue and conferences around this subject of education reform, we just a few weeks ago had Dr. Anju Maltaf from Lunds present at UC Berkeley in an evening talk. And uh, our relationship, our personal relationship with Anjum goes back a few years. He's been a great guide and mentor. And I mentioned to Anjum that we are planning some conferences. We will do a couple in Pakistan as well. We'd like you to be involved. And he raised a very good point uh, and a suggestion. Go to the small towns, go to the villages. Don't just go to Lahore and Karachi and Islamabad. Go and talk to the people in the farms and find out what they want to, to see done. And that's what we plan to do. And I, I would like to take it one step beyond. We will also, with your guidance, sir, speak to madrasas and see how they would like to be integrated into the mainstream system. And I would encourage TCF to uh, take that action. Thank you very much. I think the underpinning to that question was also about forums where all the stakeholders can come together. 
And Bela, can you just quickly comment on that? Because I know that even the education policy, when it's made, uh, a lot of the stakeholders are a part of it, and there is a collation of all the education players. Well, um, I mean, I think just to bring it on board that uh, both in Balochistan and in Sindh, the local education group, which is part of the Global Partnership for Education, has uh, meant that, I mean, we've had people from TCF always participate in that. TCF is very much, you know, looking and hearing at what is, what's happening. I think what is important is to see a forum which distills some practices and to be able to develop systems. What Saad mentioned this morning, you know, we need systems that can scale. Pilots are not needed. We've had too many pilots in this country. We know what works. We just need to do it. So I think the issue is, you know, upgraded systems which will, uh, which will be predictable and can happen and you can cost it out and you say you do it. So I think that's important and I think TCF is uh, now definitely opened up because they had this focus on the on their milestone and I think they've got more time also to um, so, talk yeah. and to share whatever they've produced with many more people. And we'd be very happy to do it. We are just launching a portal called Teachers Without Frontiers, which is on blended learning. We'd love to have anything that you want on there so it goes far and wide. And we yeah. work with teacher unions also, which are a very large number of okay. teachers in public. Thank you. Government. The next question was on Madrasa as to who would be the who would have the ownership to take it forward. No, it's a very good question. You also asked uh, who, yeah, which NGO also? who the indigenous NGO was, and uh, uh, I'll tell you that privately. I make a habit not to mention their name in public to connect it with ours because we got very targeted, and we don't want them targeted. Um, in terms of who it should, you know, when we brought the Madrasa Oversight Board back from Egypt and Turkey, one, one in the, the wake of, immediate wake of that, uh, there was a lot of press. Uh, the government signed uh, an agreement with the Madrasa leaders. I mean, there's deep mistrust between the Madrasa leaders and the government. We worked hard to try to bridge that gap. Uh, and we felt we had succeeded when, uh, uh, you know, it, the, the government of Pakistan needs to own its Madrasas, if you will. Uh, but the problem is, every time, including this latest time, the government always reneges on its promises. It does not provide the resources required to provide the textbooks and the teachers in the new disciplines. And, and absent that, uh, there's just not a whole lot of hope. Now, somebody mentioned that the madrasas are like, there's two million kids in the madrasas, there's t over 20 million in the public school system. Uh, the same kind of a, the problem exists on the public side. In November of uh, 2011, we uh, issued a report uh, for the uh, U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom about the public schools and discriminatory content, the curriculums and all that. And we learned what a lot of people already know, that there are, there's so much corruption in the system in terms of what they call ghost schools, schools that only exist on paper, uh, schools that do exist where the teachers never show up but get paid. Uh, one of the most heartrending moments I had was w when we were in, in one town, remote town, uh, where the little girls would gather together for uh, teach teaching in, in a madrasa to, to be instructed, and the teachers wouldn't show up. And this one little girl, and, and this was typical, she got up at 4.30 every morning to do all the day's chores so she could go to school on time. And these little girls are there tr trying to teach one another, okay? And they want to be they want to be lawyers. They want to be doctors. They want to be. I mean, it's just it's very inspiring to see the the not only the the aspiration but the determination that they show. And if if this could you know if all of this could be captured in a in a in a a righteous way, <laughs> I think Pakistan there'd be no holding back. But until that that government problem of trying to keep the masses down. Uh, is resolved. I, I'm afraid that we're all just sort of whistling in the wind to some extent. I don't mean to rain on the parade, but it's a, it's a very tough slug. Thank you. Uh, the next question about education and governance issues, I would like to field it to Dr. Steer. Can you? Um, I think that's a really, really good question and one that we definitely need to pay a lot of attention to. Um, looking at Bangladesh, I think they have been, because their delivery has been so centralized and sort of top down, um, their preoccupation has been with um, making that more efficient. Um, 
for example, they have two different budgets. Each of those budgets are governed by different sort of ways of, of, of organizing them and, and, and uh, allocating money. They have different ministries that have responsibility over the government schools, um, other ministries over the madrasas, another ministry over the NGO schools, so that is an issue. Um, and then at the national level, uh, they do have this primary education development uh, program, which is heavily supported by donors. That has been really quite effective in uh, establishing some benchmarks and monitoring those on an ongoing basis. So they do have uh, actually quite impressive um, um, monitoring exercises on annual basis to see what is going on. But it's, it's very top at the top. And so the question is, how does one take that very high level information and then do something about the issues that are very much at the grassroots? Um, and, and they have recognized this and, are, and that's one of the big reasons why as part of the decentralization effort that they want to um, uh, decentralize um, their, their, the, the decision making as well. But at the moment, uh, the problem is the decentralization process is more or less political, but it hasn't really um, gone down to a decision. So the local levels don't have decision making power, don't have the resources necessarily to make changes and, and adjust things. Um, there is, um, there are plans to give more direct grants to schools so that schools become, uh, have more kind of oversight and also more uh, power over that. Um, in terms of as, as, as the decentralization effort progresses, um, some of the checks and balances that uh, they want to put in place um, are around improving school-based uh, management. Um, so that's one, I don't know what the experience with that is in, in uh, Pakistan, but they, they are definitely, that's one of the, of the things they're working on. Um, at the moment, those committees haven't been, ha they've been there, but haven't been working that well and are often um, somewhat politicized. So th they're, they're sorting through uh, those issues. Another, um, Another um, step they could take, which is the one we very strongly recommend, is to rationalize this, this, the funding allocation and to keep better track of where the money is going. At the moment, um, no one can tell us how much money even a subject, a district or a school is getting. So all the data that we were able to present was actually data that we had to put together. So there is no data on what money or how much is going to a particular sub-district because teachers are paid out of this pot and then construction comes out of this pot and no one actually is putting it together. So working much harder on getting that data at a, at a sufficiently disaggregated level that actually decisions can be made based upon them and having much more transparency around the allocation um, of, of those resources. Um, which actually gets me to the final point um, that as an education community, uh, we should get much more actively engaged with the reform agendas around public financial management. And it's something we kind of tend to shy away from. Education ministries don't tend to have very uh, un, um, often strong in terms of negotiating with finance ministries. And so making that connection more uh, would certainly be very helpful. Okay. I want to add a little bit to this. Um, just taking that example of uh, decentralization and the desire to, to decentralize, Pakistan has gone through that at least one step, which is devolving from the center to the provinces. We have mentioned that earlier in the morning session, but I just want to reiterate that the game has changed now. Now the federal government that used to decide how much money will go to education is not a player as such anymore. The pro provincial governments are taking the decision as to how much money will be allocated to the education. So in that way, the federal, the two houses, the two prestigious houses of the federal government can only decide for the capital city and the villages surrounding the capital city. So that is the only arena that they have for decision making. The provincial governments are taking the responsibility for that. Now we hope that it goes one step further 
and it gets devolved to the district level so that the districts and, and then the lower uh, the councils can also be a part of decision making. But that change has happened. And that has opened doors for a lot of opportunities. And the provinces now suddenly have more money. And some of them do not know how to spend it. Uh, because after <laughs> so after the NFC awards, uh, like I gave the example of Balochistan, they suddenly have almost three times more money. <laughs> And that is where the the priority, G. G. Now the challenge will be whether they are able to spend that money or not. But they do have the decision making, and they do have the resources at that level. And the decision making players have changed. So we need to look at that when we talk about reform processes. Yes. Yeah. Actually, I wanted to add something to this because I spent five years living in Indonesia, um, and Indonesia went through a very successful decentralization program. Um, and I think there's a lot to learn from um, some of the, the work that I was engaged in then, which actually was around business environment, was that um, th one can create, um, if one has the data and makes that data available, uh, some, some competition can emerge between, healthy competition between subnational governments around um, their performance. Yes. So. Uh, what we did with respect to business environment was uh, working with an, with a foundation and NGOs to um, advertise how well each of these subnational governments were point. doing. Yeah. And it, it, we had mayors knocking on our doors asking what could we do to improve because we'd like to get up in this ranking. We'd like to do better. So I don't know where this might be an idea to look into if one could start comparing yep. um, the provinces and, and kind of advertise that. Yes, and we've tried that on women's issues and it has worked quite a bit. I have two questions. And then you, please. Actually, just building on this question of comp healthy competition between the Punjab government and the KPK government because of the work that LFLN is doing and publicizing the data mm -hmm. and the school district rankings, there has actually started to be some competition of what KP is doing and what Punjab is doing on improving enrollment numbers, impro uh, improving teacher, uh, uh, teacher attendance numbers. So there is this healthy competition mm -hmm. starting. Mm -hmm. And just to comment on the, the forum issue, and in my comments I'd made that, that uh, a couple, the US government and, and DFID in Pakistan is actually trying to start a, uh, develop an edu education development partners forum and to set up a secretariat. But the issue with most of these organ most of these secretariats and forums is it's always NGOs that have more national prominence that are at the table. It's not these local NGOs, not the village NGOs, not the village schools that are, th that they don't have the opportunity to be at the table. So I would suggest to some of these national level NGOs or you know even provincial level NGOs to make sure that those other models and those other voices are represented at these types of forums. And, and there are many local forums also where the education uh, players related to education. <laughs> yes. Dr. Steer, my question with you is uh, purely technical. Um, your Indonesian experience of devolution, um, what was the impact on standardization, quality control, and education for all? You know, as, as the state being an overarching um, police on education. So, when the provin provinces got the control of the finances for the education, did they also become decision makers as to who gets the education, what kind of quality will be implemented, or was that retained by the state? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah I'm I may need to defer this question because I was actually not working on education in, in Indonesia. To, so to give a detailed answer to that, I think I, I, I would need to um, look at the evidence. But um, yeah, I think the, the, the Indonesian um, government is actually in the report. We, we have some of sort of the examples of what has happened in Indonesia. They've, they've set some standards um, that, that are sort of um, that that different uh, districts or subnational uh, kabupatens need to 
need to comply with. Uh, so there are actually some examples in, in the report that you could, uh, could look at. The overarching policy is coming from the federal government. Yeah, there are some standards being set, yes, by, by the government, by the f uh, federal government. Is that yeah. the same case in Pakistan, Prabhu? Uh, now it, ha it is all being devolved. So uh, there was a uh, kind of an outline, curriculum outline, that used to be a national thing. Now the provinces, uh, the provinces are free to do their curriculum. And already Sindh is quite advanced in that. They have gone through, I think, one to four recent, recent huh? textbooks, textbooks uh, a review of that. Uh, so now the provinces can actually add topics of provincial history or any heroes that they think are important, language issues. Sindh was more advanced in past also uh, because the provinces were not using all the rights or provisions that they had. Uh, so Sindhi language was a part of the, uh, the uh, primary education at some point. Not, but not in the other, so I'm comparing that, not in the other provinces. Yes. So, but that is in Sindh only. So I'm saying that Sindh has been in advanced in the past also by asserting what they want for their education system. But now all the provinces have the opportunity. And so provinces are the ones who will define what goes into the curriculum and the textbooks, etc. So all that decision making has been devolved to the provinces. Add one that, um, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, what they have now is they've come back to we have two mechanisms at the central level. One is the IPCC, which is the Interprovincial Council of Common Interest, and they meet, and that's a very high level. And th now the this new ministry, because it's gone through a fourth name change at the federal level, and they have created an advisory body to look at issues. So they're, they're trying to come up with ways and means to do it. But I also want to bring up that some good practices, easy pesa, or basically, which is uh, branchless banking, managing stipends for girls in Sindh. Or for example, through the state bank agreement, having uh, commercial and government banks uh, 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 disburse sure. money to the SMCs in Sindh. Now, that's all very well that you know, you're know you coming up with ways and means to perhaps make it more accountable, governance-wise, more transparent, and so on. But two things are really the biggest hurdle. One is, if the Sindh government will not put its act together administratively and gets the mainstream department, not a technical department like the RSU, the Reform Support Unit, but till the special secretaries don't get their act together, well, deliv ser social service delivery or education delivery enrollment will not happen. Number two, till the people and the parents and the school management committees do not take interest in the children's education, which is the other story, and they don't rise to the occasion to find out what money came to the school. There should be a school report card which says this money was allocated to the school, this came, this didn't come, and then they do, do, do something. Well, the inertia has to go. It has to, it's a wake up call for all of us. And as much as, so then only the governance story will improve, whether it's Sindh or KP or wherever. And some of these measures that Sindh has done, for example, Easy Pesa and also money going directly to the SMC accounts, which never used to go. Every time it used to be done through giving, get, getting everybody there. And the Minister of Education used to negotiate with me when I used to work with the Sindh government, that please tell me how much will the MQM government announce and give off you know, these checks. So this check business is finished. Good thing. Mm -hmm. But then what happens next? Okay. There is a supplementary information that you're giving. You have a new question. Uh, no, I just wanted to, one point of clarification that <coughs> as far as the standardization is concerned in Pakistan, for the tertiary level, there is a national standard set by the Higher Education Commission, that which every promise has to follow. So that's, that's changing now. Uh, KP uh, has already made a... They have uh, some of the... Provinces have instituted their own higher ah, that's education true. commission. That's true. The law has yes, but still has time. Yet yeah. become effective. True. Because the higher education still remains as part of the. They have a time limit, I think. Exactly. Yes. So I just wanted to make that clarification. Okay. We have to go to Irfan. You have a question, and then I'm coming to you, Amjad Sab. 
Okay. <laughs> My understanding is, I, I wish I'm wrong, that most madrasas have um, an association with one sect or the other. Ifaq. And, and the sect. sect. Yeah. And in, in this present context of, uh, you know, this very volatile, uh, you know, uh, uh, the fault lines uh, as far as the sectarian uh, conflicts are concerned, what, what do we really mean by mainstreaming of madrasas if we're not able to deal with their, you know, sectarian associations? Because they grow up to hate the other sect and, you know, in, in some ways they're called malamati or, you know, th those people who reject the other sect. And, and uh, I don't know if this is something that you've also looked at. Or uh, yes, we have, and we address it very directly. And we've had a lot of actual cooperation between, uh, there's four sects plus Jamaat Islam, you know, the Diobandi, the Shia, the Barelvi, um, what have you. And uh, uh, your, the way they have existed in the past, there has been a lot of provocation uh, and animosity toward other sects. But we've been able to deal with them on a collective basis uh, for much of the training. And uh, this is all part of the human rights and religious tolerance. And the, to the religious tolerance piece gets you into the sectarian side as well. So I, I, I am optimistic in terms of the the uh, uh, the reforms that we've been pushing with the madrasas because they're taking root and people are buying in. Where I'm not so optimistic is I'm just not quite sure how we answer the, that, that broader question of how we eventually get them mainstream because mainstream is, has got a lot of problems with it. And, and I think sometimes that the government may be well intended in cutting these deals but at the last minute, you know, the rationale they use for backing out is they don't want the mo money misused for terrorism, this sort of thing. And so at some, some way, the trust has to be rebuilt, and, and we've worked hard at that. And I think some gains will take place over time, but you still have this business of the feudalism that I'm not quite sure how you get around. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you want to ask a question here? There is another one. <coughs> Uh, let me ask you, yeah, you, you go ahead and ask your question. Um, I think this is directed to Bayad Jamil. Um, I was just wondering, um, where does sex ed or sexual education stand in Pakistani schools? And also, I was wondering sex if... Sex education. Okay. And I was also wondering, does TCF um, promote any like se uh, sex education initi initiatives? Uh, so, um, in 2002 or so, uh, under the then ministry and its curriculum wing. Uh, this was formally taken up. But like so much else, these areas became additives to curriculum. They were never really integrated in the sort of student learning outcomes as such. The 2006 national curriculum gives some reference to this so that it's enough space for books to be developed. However, we have not seen books develop because they still go through these NOCs. So even though uh, the production of textbooks have become far more open than they were earlier, but they, they still go through the screenings again and again, and there isn't a consensus on it. Having said that, in some provinces, uh, under various initiatives on HIV AIDS and um, SRHR, there is a quite a bit of work going on in schools both in public sector and private sector, but more in private sector schools. And private sector schools have been very open uh, to these programs. Um, in fact, my organization is also involved with that in very large number of schools. And there seems to be a demand because uh, everything has become very open. Uh, you know, children have access to every information. So it's better at least to engage them and so that they can take responsible decisions. So it's a kind of a lively atmosphere out there. Uh, there's a discussion that's going on. There are people talking about it, in fact, even in madrasas. Uh, but uh, similarly, but a district may decide to be very heavy-handed, as Gujranwala was, called the head of that institution and said, who are you to start this in the government school? So the government schools are a little bit cagey because 
it's political and so on and so forth. But yes, there's a, there's a lot that's happening. It's a very lively environment. If you uh, want to know more, I can send that information. Uh, there are other organizations also, I think Sahil comes to mind immediately, that have, that have focused uh, totally on yeah, sexual abuse and they train teachers, they train parents. On sex HIV. education, but yeah, it goes beyond that too. And for TCF, I would like uh, Amjad, Amjad Nurani Sab to respond to that. Uh, TCF leaders from all over the world get together every two years. And in April 2013, we had our last global chapters of Global Leaders Conference in Karachi. One of the points that were um, suggestions that was made at the final brainstorming session was to introduce reproductive health education in TCF. So that is one of our priorities, if you may. I recently followed up with uh, someone in the education department uh, and asked her what had happened to that priority. And she said, nothing so far. We are having another conference next March and you can bet I'm gonna bring it up again. <laughs> Uh, what she said, what she said was, it is a sensitive issue and we have to be careful and rightfully so, but it will be part of health education, okay? So TCF is not going to shy away from it and we'll make sure it doesn't. Well, I have the mic. I would like to do a, a little exercise and survey of the audience here. First of all, what do you think of the selection of speakers and the topics for this conference? Oh. <laughs> I think we should, we should leave. <laughs> except, except Bela. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bela was a little over the edge. <laughs> but we love, <laughs> yes, in a, in a nice way. Uh, there was, uh, you know, the last few questions uh, revolved around devolving or devolution. Mm -hmm. So before we put that topic aside, I'd like to ask three of our speakers, two of whom, uh, three of whom actually are uh, closely connected to Pakistan uh, as Pakistanis. And I'd like to ask Irfan, Jumaina, and Bela to give me a yes or no, or a good or bad answer. What do you think of devolution? Good, good. Yes. And then I always give the example of the Center for Disease Control and Advantage. I say, you know, you have one center for disease control. You didn't have to have 12 centers of um, the uh, national education assessment system simply because it was a procurement challenge for the donors. Now, when you do that, you make a hash of something. So instead of having standards, you end up having something which is a hodgepodge. So the national education assessment system which was meant to create benchmarks and st standards, has gone to dogs with 10 centers, not having the f mm. funds for salaries, but no funds for the activities. So some things are good devolved, and some things which are systems and benchmarks oriented need to be somewhere in the, because they're the same with the equity sensitivity for different areas. So I, I think one has to have a nuanced view of that, and that's what even theory and practice says that you know it's not decentralization is not a panacea mm -hmm. for some things yes mm -hmm. all the way and for some things no you have to devolve lots of the school districts yes as well and they're more if we go even in south africa right down to the school which can manage its own audit it's given its own uh, accounts directly including the salary to the teachers so there are many examples but we need that but sadly in our country 
devolution has every time happened, has happened with the military governments to seek legitimacy. And hence, they just put, get put aside and we b throw the baby with the bath water so often and hence the resistance to devolution. This is the first time it has come through uh, political process. Thank you. Certainly, to me personally, devolution does make sense because it is easier and more efficient to manage and run a smaller unit than one big monster. But I would hate to see four monsters created <laughs> out of one. Or seven. So we have to, or seven. So we have to be controlling these monsters and, and shaping them, modeling them the way they sh should be ideally. So I'll hand it back with that to close here. I think there are a few more. We have a few more, a little more time. No, I, I just have a question. Two, we'll take two, yours and uh, Daniel, yours. This is pretty simple, I think. Uh, it's my understanding that the matric exam is your ticket to university. No. No? Grade 12. Or, but no, if each province has... Uh, college, no. Yes. But if each, if each province has a different curriculum, can there be a standardized test? Yes. Uh, the boards are all already different. I mean, it's not. No, we have a national curriculum, and the student learning outcomes are the same, irrespective. They have to. The provinces have signed on a declaration that they will follow the national curriculum. The national curriculum puts out the student learning outcomes for each subject by level, okay. and that's it. Then you can make your own textbooks as yeah. you want to. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Abka. The question I had was. Uh, I think somebody in the morning session mentioned basic literacy and whether enough is being done about that. And then I think of uh, the Mullah Radio, the gentleman who took over, uh, Mullah Fazlullah was also called Mullah Radio, who used the, the power of the radio to take over <laughs> SWAT for a little time. Uh, have, have we looked at m mass media like TV and radio for spreading education, what has been done about that in the public sector and in the private sector even? Good question. You want to start? So all the ILM ideas work, and a lot of work which is on education technologies is actually being tested in public sector schools. Now that's a good thing, uh, as well as in low-cost private schools. So some of the innovations are well in place, uh, I was in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa the other day, and the government is floating an RFP for setting up um, such platforms in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, where, which will be through this public-private partnership or whatever. Now, that's a, those are good things. I mean, you know, we were talking earlier, I think uh, Saad was speaking earlier, and, uh, and I think maybe Irfan also, <coughs> that, you know, uh, programs which are particularly coming out for innovations, a lot of them are coming out in areas of technologies and e-learning and blended learning and to see whether in fact the government has got appetite to invest in those. Now, it seems that it does, but you know, uh, there's a big s distance to travel between your intellectual understanding or appreciation of it and actually having an enabling physical environment and a culture which encourages teachers to participate in it. So uh, there's, there's, there's going to be interesting time, but at least the good thing is that there is a positive response. And there's also, by the way, on radio also, uh, Ilm Ideas has gone. So there are very exciting, innovative ideas there for the picking, whether it is the education foundations who take them, or low-cost private schools, or TCF, or the public sector for its mainstream programs and teacher training. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, Okay. Also to tell me what TCF is doing in this regard, and just remember that your volunteers and donors are sitting over here. <laughs> yes. TCF, uh, as I was talking a little bit while earlier, TCF is uh, planning on, you know, people keep asking us what next, are you going to keep on building schools? Uh, and we said no, uh, we want to consolidate, uh, but of course, uh, there is some uh, important aspect to be addressed, and that is the mismatch. Uh, Bela would love that, which is between the primary and the secondary and schools. And uh, the same uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of is the case in, in, the, in, in Citizen Foundation. Uh, out of the 1,000 schools, some 680 schools are primary, 
and only 320 schools are secondary. So our first concern is to sort of bridge this gap or bring this mismatch into uh, place, you know. So we hope that every child has the uh, possibility of going into the secondary level. So having said that, that is going on its own, but uh, we, we feel that we need to do more. Uh, now we have created a successful model. Now we need to leverage this model. We need to put this m uh, model, like we said, into the quality improvement program, or like Daniel said, the TCF in a box. All that learning of 18 years to be transferred primarily within Pakistan and then maybe in the region and maybe in the world, whatever, whoever else wants to uh, sort of take uh, uh, help from us. And this is the honest desire. And in doing this, obviously, we have also started uh, dabbling in the e-learning. We have had a pilot with the Khan Academy, and the learning management system for teachers on tablets was very successful, where the capacity building of those teachers has taken place. And now we are going to, obviously, money is always a constraint, but we are going to hopefully focus on this and try to uh, apply this on, a, on, a, on, a, on the 7,700 teachers. Uh, it's just uh, 700 teachers went through the uh, e-learning. But uh, last uh, month, we had a, a, a board meeting where we said that IR, uh, IRI, which is the interactive radio instructions, is a very potential avenue of uh, learning especially for those children who are slightly over, uh, over the uh, young, young uh, formative age, you know. So we want to take uh, the education to the homes of these children, primarily through volunteers. And this is now being actively pursued. And hopefully, uh, j just pray for us, and a lot of good wishes and a lot of money is needed to <laughs> maybe implement this program. But we are definitely embarked on a much broader sort of a a uh, way where we could uh, impart to millions of children. OK, thank you. We will take two more questions. And after that, I will ask uh, Mr. Mushtaq Shapra to conclude. Uh, Sakib, Sahib, your, yours, and then Irfan. Uh, it's uh, more of a just adding to what you have said, that in case of uh, learning through media, uh, the Ilama Iqbal Open University does that, virtual university does that, and now, Actually, many universities have their own FM radios, mm. uh, including the, uh, the uh, institution that I was associated with. They are being ru run by their media science departments. Zabist. Zabist. And it was, the guy was called Mullah FM. Not Mullah Radio. Yes. But is this university level education or is it? Yeah, this is, I'm talking of the university level education. Yes. 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 Primary but primary. once you have this, and it starts to yes. take root. We have examples of we it. We have yeah. examples. Fatma Jinnah uh, University is is working on a television station also, yes. in addition to a radio. Uh, Irfan, your last comment, please. Then we will conclude. I just had a comment about technology. Um, you know, a couple months back, Minister of Education of Punjab um, floated an idea that we should go give these Android tablets to all children in Punjab. And that it looked like a decision that they'll give these tablets to uh, children in Punjab. And the justification was that these will replace the textbooks. Mm -hmm. you know? I wrote an article about that as well. And I said, look, there are two aspects of uh, proposals like this that we have to take into account. Uh, one, that there's got to be some public debate about uh, proposals such as this, you know, th my uh, feeling was that if you give tablets to children and you load them with the textbooks, it's going to be just a matter of time, a few days, that the child is going to break the tablet, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And then if it was a textbook, you know, you just go in the market and buy the textbook, it's cheap. Or well, where are you going to get the, uh, the next tablet? So my feeling was that in proposals, proposals like this, it was the private interest of somebody who will be selling these tablets to the school system which was being served, mm -hmm. rather than the public interest. So there's got to be some debate about how to protect public interest when proposals like this are advanced. What happens? OK, thank you. Um, I would like you, uh, Mushtaq Chapra Sahab, to come and conclude the whole. Uh,
uh, conference. Thank you. One comment while he's coming up. Uh, just one thing I wanted to mention to folks is that, uh, you know, while we've commented on the fact there are only two million students in the madrasas, one thing you need to keep in mind is most of the madrasa faculty are, are, are double-headed as imams, and they reach millions uh, through their uh, Friday sermons. So it's a, it's a lot larger impact than two million would, would suggest. So uh, keep that in mind, if you will. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your presence. Uh, we at the Citizen Foundation are very grateful, first of all, to the speakers. We have had, uh, Amjad was asking what was the quality of the, I think, you know, I come from Pakistan, and I thought that the quality of the speakers was uh, excellent, and they covered a lot of ground, a lot of issues which are pertinent to uh, the, the reform the, in education. So I would, I would like to thank them, I, uh, each an individual speaker in the morning session and the speakers who have been here. And it has been a very interactive session that the real, real uh, f feeling is that a lot of uh, excitement, a lot of interest has developed in seeing uh, not only um, answers to education in Pakistan, but we have heard models from various other places, especially in the South Asian region.